evening and welcome to the Thursday, January 9th, 2020, uh, still getting used to that, uh, Northampton School Committee meeting. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair, and we'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll call. Mayor David Narkowitz. Present. Mr. Ronnie Gold. Present. Ms. Rebecca Dusansky. Present. Ms. Laura Fallon. Present. Ms. Dina Levy. Maybe. Present. <laughs> Mr. Lonnie Kaufman. Present. Ms. Kaya Goldman. Present. Ms. Emily Serapi Cox. Present. Ms. Susan Voss. Present. Mr. Sean Connolly. Present. Your Honor, you have a call. Excellent. Um, and because this is the first meeting of this new term and the newly inaugurated school committee, we have some organizational um, issues that we have to take uh, care of as, as required by both charter and by our uh, rules. Um, the first order of business is the actual adoption of our rules of procedure um, so that we can hold a meeting and follow those rules. So we do have a, um, a copy of the rules that the, uh, were in effect during the last council session. And I would, um, I would open the floor to a motion to put it on the table uh, in a second so that we could discuss and if any amendments are offered, we could um, take them up that way. So is there a motion to put these rules on the floor? A motion to put the rules on the floor. And is there a second? Second. Okay. So any discussion, comment? I know that there's some um, items that may require updating. Um, so I'm open to uh, amendments. Yes, Ms. Musansky. So just a couple, uh, yeah, just points of clarification or changes. Um, in 1.2 in our, uh, recently we just changed a policy and got rid of the word inauguration changed it to swearing in, so I just wanted to make that consistent. So the first meeting following, as you pointed out, there doesn't have to be an inauguration. We just have to be sworn in. Okay, so do you want to make that, or did you have others? I have a couple more. Okay. Um, do you want to take them one at a time, or you sure want to we can take the them. whole um, list? Is it all in that section or in other? Areas? Uh, well, 1.3. Okay. Why don't we just do them? Let's do them one section by section. So 1.2. So you're making a motion to amend to remove an, an inauguration mm -hmm. to following swearing. The swearing in. Does um, that make sense? Uh, yeah. That, I mean. Um, the first meeting following being sworn in, the committee yeah. smithing. Yeah. Swearing in of members, perhaps? Yeah, the following swearing in of members. Perfect. Perhaps just because, yeah. Swearing in of members. Okay. All right. Is there a second on that amendment? Second. Okay. Any discussion about it? Okay. No discussion. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that amendment is adopted. We continue. So 1.3, um, we uh, we had started having um, a PTO liaison a couple years ago, and I didn't know if we're continuing with it, if we're not, and if so, should we include it in the in this section? I would like to make a motion to eliminate the PTO liaison. <laughs> I accept the right, and I was wrong. It's too many meetings for one person to try and attend. Okay. I think you got your answer. Okay, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Moving along. Uh, 2.3. Oh, can we, can oh. we stage with 1.3? or Sure. We, do you want to do it, I think it would by be good person if, or by section? Well, if you don't mind yielding just because I don't mind yielding. In that, same, yep. uh, in that same section, just okay. to, so uh, we're not bouncing around. Yep. So in section 1.3, I would like I would to um, add liaison to the Wellness Advisory Committee because mm. our membership mm -hmm. is required by law. Okay. So there's a motion to amend um, section 1.3 to add liaison a liaison to the Wellness Committee. Is it called the District Wellness Committee or what? Is that the just the Wellness Committee? Is it? I think we call it the Wellness Committee. Just the Wellness sure. Committee. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. <coughs> more. One more. Do we have to vote on that first? If you want to make a motion that has multiple changes, we can. If someone wants to okay, separate. Okay. In that section. Yeah. Okay. And I would also move to um, 
strike the word representative. It says a representative to the Northampton Prevention Coalition representative. Oh, yeah, that looks like it's, uh, yeah. Okay. And that's it for 1.3. Uh, okay. Uh, the, um, I have one three. You have one, two? Also one, three? Okay, can we do this one and then I'll come to you? Oh, just another one? No, 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 we're gonna finish Just Laura, finish Laura's Ms. Fallon. Laura's so, so um, uh, Ms. Fallon's made uh, a, a motion to make two amendments. Is there a second on those? Second. Okay, so again, just to review, um, uh, this is to add the liaison to the wellness committee and then to eliminate the um, repetitive use of the word representative after Northampton Prevention Coalition. Um, all those in favor of the amendments, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, so those amendments are adopted. And Mr. Kaufman. Yes, thanks. Sorry, Laura, I didn't. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to make a motion. Oh, uh, is, is introducing an idea to have a subcommittee look at something, a motion? Um, certainly you could ask to refer a, a subject to a um, committee we are in the middle of amending um, that's part of this one three. yeah we are in the middle of amending um, you know doing sub amendments to a motion to actually approve the rules of procedure but um, certainly you could s well I mean was, uh, maybe if you could just describe what you're trying to do yeah. so um, I'd like to introduce the idea of creating a another school committee liaison position this would be a liaison to the student union um, and I've thought about it I've talked to various people about it I've gotten mostly positive but not entirely positive feedback on the idea um, and I honestly have not had time to look into other models and so so my idea would be to recommend that the rules and policy uh, recommend this idea to the rules and policy subcommittee to see if uh, they can do a little bit of investigation as to what um, this role would be whether there's other districts that do this kind of work and could uh, maybe talk to some students about their interest in doing so so I think what I'm doing is making a motion to bring forth a new position uh, for a, a subcommittee to investigate that's what but not for purposes of amending this but just to send the idea to rules and policy for study and then Correct. make a recommendation Correct. okay um, <laughs> I'll entertain that motion if someone wants to second it uh, awesome. meaning meaning I, I, I it's we're sort of in the middle of something but I, I understand the spirit of why you're offering it here because we're looking at that so that's if you'll second I'll it. second okay any discussion on that okay so uh, mr. Kaufman wishes to um, to instruct the uh, rules and policy committee t to when it is formed uh, to take up this idea of and study the idea of a liaison to the student union yeah and can I say a couple words on that then uh, sure I mean, I, I, I think we've done an excellent job in um, having a student rep. Uh, Eleanor is one of three or four in my three years on the, on the school committee. Um, I think having a student rep is absolutely fantastic, and I think we took that to another level about a year and a half ago by having um, every other meeting, having a student uh, union or the student uh, advisory council um, present uh, a half, half hour of our school committee meeting uh, to present a topic of interest to them and having some discussion back and forth um, and I think that's fantastic to get students input so I, I really wanted to explore this other idea of getting student voice but this would be a little bit different in the fact that I envision this person more meeting students at the high school it's really a high school type of position high school union um, and <clears throat> not only being a liaison and bringing information back to the school committee but meeting students on their own turf and and hopefully expanding it beyond the the students that are involved in student government maybe you would help facilitate meetings and what have you but it would give us another opportunity to get sort of full input from um, other students okay so that's the idea excellent any questions or uh, further discussion on the motion hearing none uh, all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the motion uh, carries. Is there anything else related to 1.3? I, I would ask, um, you know, our friends uh, who are recording used to be called NCTV. They're now called Northampton mm -hmm. Open. <coughs> so we may want to update that um, in the in that section if someone would be willing to make that. I move to uh, replace Northampton Community Television with Northampton Open Media. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that one? 
Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, so that uh, carries. Um, any um, any um, issues with 1.4? Okay. Um, any ish, uh, now we're moving into section two, standing committees. Um, any questions on 2.1? I would move to, um, just for consistency purposes, under 2.1C, uh, subcommittee for superintendent evaluation of three members. Is there a second on that? Can I add? Just for consistency, since they all say a subcommittee on, can C also say a subcommittee on? Sure. <laughs> That's great. Um, Second. So you'll accept that friendly amendment to your yes. amendment? Yes. Okay. So, um, so all those in favor of that amendment, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Moving to 2.2. .2. Any um, questions? <coughs> on uh, Ms. Fallon. Um, I understand why it doesn't fall under 2.1, but I wonder we don't mention um, the negotiating subcommittee and so I would move that uh, before the last se uh, sentence of se uh, section 2.2 where so it would read uh, within one week following the first meeting in January following an election year the chair shall appoint the various subcommittees each committee member shall be appointed to one of the three subcommittees I would move to add in this section um, Additionally, there shall be a negotiation subcommittee comprised of three members, or I don't know how many members we're going to have, uh, who will meet um, on an as-needed basis to conduct collective bargaining on behalf of the full committee. Okay. Um, is there a second on that for purposes of discussion? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so then essentially what you're saying is that th there's three standing committees, but then additionally there is this other committee which meets as needed to do um, things related to collective bargaining, which has been our practice. Um, it just is, ha isn't actually codified anywhere in our, um, in our rules of procedure. Any questions about that? Okay, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, moving on. Uh, She said three, yeah, three members. I mean, and we've sometimes we've had two with an alternate. It's been, but I think three is consistent with the rest of our um, with the rest of our committees. And um, obviously, if someone's absent, there could not be a meeting if it's a two-member committee because there's not a quorum. So I think three is probably a better number to have. Um, two point three. Any questions about two point three? Yes, Miss Busansky. So I wanted to, uh, two things. First, um, in our policy BDE, we say that, um, that issues can be considered uh, if they've been referred by the full school committee or when requested by the administration. And so I wanted to be consistent and include that here. I think it's an important point that sometimes the superintendent refers something to a subcommittee and we take it up without a vote of the full committee. So that was the first. Um, secondly, I always find this kind of circular. The chair has to call the meeting, but the chair can't be elected until it meets, right? So I thought maybe we could clarify it by saying, um, shall elect their own chairs at their first meeting of the calendar year. The first meeting may be called by any member of the subcommittee or the superintendent. And then meetings of all subcommittees shall each be called by the respective chairs and only to consider business referred by the full school committee or uh, requested by the administration. Okay. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? Um, okay. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Okay, 2.4. Anything else? Um, it does seem like uh, in section three, um, I think we have this, seems like we're missing one of the standing committees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Someone wants to? Uh, yeah, for uh, just going along with consistency, it seems like three, three should be a one sentence summary of the um, superintendent evaluation subcommittee. And then what is 3-3 three, three should become 3-4. Three, okay. Um, 
Does anyone second? Oh, is that a motion? Making a motion? Yes. The motion. First motion. But there's no language, so we need to I, have language. I, so. I think there's language later somewhere. On section 11. On section 11. 11. Could be new there. Okay. So, um, so. so if, if eleven one. Okay. So would we want to move the language of eleven one up to that location? I'll add that to my motion. Okay, great. Um, where we've already spelled out the evaluation committee. So, um, okay, so there's been a motion uh, made uh, to amend um, and renumber that section uh, and, and have a um, reference to superintendent evaluation. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Mr. Kaufman. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I have already, like, I, I've already worked on this a little bit. Let me just explain. I, I think the idea of merging 3.1 and 11 makes sense, so I took a stab at that, Sean, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, but there's another element of new language I wanted to put in there, so if I uh, throw this out there for Sean's reconsideration, is that the way to do this? Um, we could, or, or, do I or we could just approve his amendment and then you could vote to you could move to amend it further if you wanted or you could or throw the language out whatever whichever you'd like we're getting really deep I know the, I know so, All right. so, so here's the language that I had suggested yeah. and then I want to just back up and I'll, I'll take us I'll take a second in the middle to explain my new language but the language I had suggested would be manages the annual superintendent evaluation process based on mutually agreed upon district goals and the implementation of the district improvement plan using a process consistent with state law and regulations about educator evaluation. That's more or less what it says in section 11. Mm -hmm. It's just a tiny wordsmith of manages as opposed to, as opposed to evaluate. Okay. So this is managing the evaluation process as opposed to evaluating the sure. Superintendent manages the evaluation. Okay, but you don't have eleven. Uh, Sean's at a disadvantage because he didn't receive it. That's what. Oh, I have eleven here. You have eleven. I have eleven. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. So, would you accept so, that as a friendly amendment to your amendment? Sure. Okay. Sure. So then, um, so then the motion, the amendment before the committee then would be to um, move eleven. Well. Move the, the, the now amended language of 11 um, to become the new 3.3, um, and then 3.3 would be renumbered to become 3.4. Is there a um, second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, excellent. So that one, um, and I assume your intent, just to, for the clerk, was to, well, strike 11 so we're gonna have to well so that's why I think why I had the confused look on my face is was was the intention to also modify the language in 11 or was it to re I think we were moving it up I think that was the idea was to move it up okay yeah. the, the, the language that I had recommended is virtually the same as 11 so I merged it it looks like okay. yeah so, so 11 is relevant now what's that striking 11 I think we are I think yes that's, I think the idea was to move it up where it belongs up at 3.2. So we'll have to remember that those from everything after. Yeah, everything after. So that's now 3.4? Um, that's actually 3.3. 3. 3. 3. 3. 3. Okay. And then this last section becomes 3.4. Uh, okay. Yes. So can I make an amendment okay. 3.3? Uh, sure. sure. Okay. So the, se the second thing I was thinking here, and um, <clears throat> I would like to make a motion to amend 3.3 .3 and add the following language. Um, the language would, re would read, the superintendent's final written evaluation will consider input from all members of the school committee using a formal process to capture members' feedback. Second. Okay. That the so that's 3.3, .3, so putting that at the end of 3.3. .3. I think that's logically where it goes. Okay. I'm certain. Where it goes is not as important as the language itself. A uh, second on that. Um, could you repeat that? Sure. The language I'm recommending is the superintendent's final written evaluation will consider input from all members of the school committee using a formal process to capture members' feedback. Okay. Um, you have a question? Question, comment. Okay. Um, 
Because that is going to make that's going to make 3.3 significantly longer than the others. Is there any? I'm just wondering if we're going to be adding on to it if we should have left it as 11. Point, mm. As 11 as under evaluation, we're going to add that language to it also because then we're not talking about subcommittees anymore. We're talking about evaluation, mm -hmm. and so I, I would probably prefer to leave it under evaluation and then modify the language and add that and have it appear twice because one is the, yeah, the I, 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 I'm, that's, that, yeah. Okay. Tricky, yeah. right? So I, I, that's, I think in terms of location, that's fine with me, yeah. but in terms of content? No, I think the con, I don't think she's disagreeing on the content. Yeah. She's just saying it applies to the full school committee, not to the subcommittee. Yeah. So, um, so would you maybe withdraw that until we get back down to 11, which I guess isn't gone, uh, <laughs> and then we can, we can be reinserted there. Okay, okay perfect. Um, so uh, next is section four, ad hoc and advisory committees. Any questions about that one? Um, yes. I'm sorry, back on section three, did we need to have the negotiation subcommittee in there, or? We just, we did that. Oh, we did that. Yeah, yeah. So there's only three? No. No, I don't know if we did that. Earlier. Oh, hmm. we did that up in the other part, but not. Uh, although it's not a standing committee, it was sort of listed as an as needed. Um, but, we, but I guess we could. Well, yes. I feel like so. The reason we didn't include it under standing committees was because it wasn't a standing committee. But this is responsibility of subcommittees, and it is a subcommittee. It's just not a standing subcommittee. So I would actually agree with um, okay. Mr. Gold. Do you want to make that motion, Mr. Gold, to then essentially add? <laughs> That was added earlier to, um, I guess it will become the new 3.3. And process is that what that Yeah. All right. I make a motion to add uh, the negotiation subcommittee and a short description of it to section three. Okay. Um, mirroring the description that was added um, in standing committees. Okay. Um, is there a second on that? Second. Okay. Um, and as part of that, we will now then renumber um, former 3.3 that became 3.4 is now 3.5. <laughs> it's a, the little section that could is uh, chugging <laughs> on the chart. Oh, did we vote on that um, We haven't voted yet. No. Um, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you for catching that. Ms. Bond. I hate to go back, but 1.3 in the line of this, it says, the chair shall appoint the various subcommittees when, in fact, I believe the chair is appointing either a liaison or a representative to those subcommittees. So we might want to clarify that because you're not actually appointing those subcommittees. Uh, okay. Um, I don't think. Maybe just okay. the the. Well, those are two no, different no, things, true. aren't they? Well, he is in section two, but in, not in section one. She's talking about one point three. So. Where, where in one point? I guess. Do you want me to make a motion? Um, sure. Uh, uh, my motion would be to replace um, the chair shall appoint the various subcommittees to the chair shall appoint a liaison to the various subcommittees. So the charter says, I've got the charter, it says the chair um, uh, shall appoint. All oh, members of all, all members right. of all subcommittees of the school committee is what right. the charter says. Yeah. So, so they're, they're two different things, right? The subcommittees no, yeah. and the liaisons are right. two separate yeah. things. But he's right. appointing both of them, so they both so, have to be listed there. Yeah. So, okay. <coughs> it, it reads as appoint the various subcommittees, semicolon, parliamentarian goes through the whole list and any other such positions. That's what's confusing about it. Down below it says and any It's not subcommittees such. colon. It's not describing yeah. the Okay. If it's okay, that's fine. I was getting confused by all the different kinds of Yeah, it's it gets it's a word salad there of a lot of different Oh things. I see what you're saying. <laughs> Thanks. I'm you, good. You're good. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Okay, um, so back down to um, section four. Were there any? Um, yes. I think it's now section 3.5. Yes. Other matters may be referred to the subcommittees by the vote of the full committee. Um, I would move to strike the hyphen. Okay. <laughs> Just for consistency with all the other subcommittees. Second. Okay. So there's a motion made and seconded to strike the hyphen. Um, any 
discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, that, that, that amendment is approved. Um, Student Advisory Committee, Section 5. Um, I don't think there's any changes to that. I think we're following state law on that one, so we're, that's sort of um, adhering to that. Section 6 is filling of vacancies. Um, this is language uh, that I think matches the charter. Um, I'm not sure I've ever heard it called a joint convention, but that's, that's fine. Um, and um, replacement of members on subcommittees. Any questions about that? Financial procedures. Uh, this one, I don't know if you had a chance to look at, Ms. Oh, yes. Yeah, I did. Okay. So, Section 8.1. Uh, I would move to replace it with all bills against the school department shall be approved pursuant to policy DK payment procedures. Okay. So you would be making a reference to our our more updated policy with how we handle those things. Policy. Yes. Okay. okay. And then you would uh, strike the rest of that. Uh, of 8.1. Okay. Does someone second that? Second. Okay. Any discussion on that amendment? Yes. So is that's moving towards our system of having one person sign mm -hmm. exit. So my only concern is that we don't, I don't think we reference a policy anywhere else in this document. So is there a way that we could just succinctly mm -hmm. say that in the section so we just really kind of spell it out rather than referencing sure. policies? There's so much overlap in this document between this and policies and you know I know keeping them consistent well, instead of the policy name you could just say the school committee's existing policy mm -hmm. or current policy mm -hmm. and not put the actual okay. name or number would you accept that change to yes okay so do you want to just read it again for Annie just to make sure she gets um uh, all bills against the school department shall be approved pursuant to school committee policy. Is that what? Okay. Is that what you were recommending? Is there, can you second that one? Um, <laughs> <laughs> on the fence about it. But, uh, it feels like we should just state out what it, what it is. I could look up what DK I is. Have, I'm but then when we don't oh, when we change yes. when we change DK then we have to remember to go back and change yeah, that's why I know I but that's it. true throughout this entire document all yeah. we're doing we're constantly changing policies and going back and changing you know the language I think what's kind of uh, nice of, or you know important about this document is that it really just spells things out for people nobody has to go and refer to the policy manual to figure out what it is we're talking about it just says warrants will be signed by one <coughs> school committee isn't that what our a representative of the school committee will sign warrants isn't that what our practice is that we started a couple of years ago instead of having five members sign you know so we uh, updated the that's, policy that's in, my yeah in September of 2019 is when we updated that policy um, I don't know how we want to word that there's no well because this all three of them reference that policy um, I mean. okay. It does. <laughs> okay so you're second. you're second thing I'm second <laughs> yeah. excellent okay all those in favor of the amendment please say aye Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that amendment is accepted. Do you have one for 8.2 or 8.3? Okay. Um, section 9, duties and responsibilities of members. Okay. Um, section 10, duties and responsibilities of auxiliary personnel. Um, section Eleven. Now we're back to section eleven, which is still with us, and it's, we're going to keep it. And it's um, evaluation. So, well, do you want to make the? Um, I want to change it. 
Okay. So this okay. is the new language for Section 11. Certainly. I'd like to um, make a motion that we adopt this new language. I'm sorry, I'll read it from the top. It's three sentence, two sentences. Manages the annual superintendent evaluation process based on mutually agreed upon district goals and the implementation of the district improvement plan using a process consistent with state law and regulations about educator evaluation. Uh, that's very similar to what we have. And then the new language is the superintendent's final, eva final written annual evaluation will consider input from all members of the school committee using a formal process to capture members' feedback. Okay. So you'd replace all that with, with what you just described? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? Yes. So I just I feel it, it's necessary for me to explain what I'm doing here. There is just some natural language massaging. The second part about um, the language that I'm trying to infer, it might not be, it, I, I'm open to modifying the language, but the idea of having the final superintendent's written evaluation consider input from all members of the school committee would, from my three-year experience, be a new approach and it would, it would involve a, a different approach than we've used in the past which is um, I've been a member of the of the superintendent evaluation subcommittee for three years and frankly we've taken the bulk of the work including the aspect of actually sitting with the superintendent and providing him with the evaluation um, it's always been honestly uncomfortable for me but not for my colleagues so I just left it as is but I have heard from others that they want to be more involved and I did speak to John earlier today and I got his feedback um, and I, 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 want to, I want to make it clear that the, how we actually do this and what other changes might come as a result of it would be up to the new, um, su the new three members that are on the superintendent's evaluation subcommittee. But, but by putting this in here now, it more or less, I think, would require us to develop a process of which there are many views in other districts that would formally gather if input from everybody and then have a person or persons synthesize all that information and deliver it to the superintendent. And that would be different. But it would be more wholesome and more transparent and more uh, inclusive for sure, in my opinion. Sorry. Okay. Any other comments about the amendment? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, um, I really like the new language. My, my only question is if we take out, and, and what I hear you saying is that it would be up to the subcommittee to determine exactly how the evaluation gets done. I just wonder if there needs to be something in here that that actually speaks to that because what, if we're taking out the language that says the subcommittee annually evaluates the superintendent, we're saying they're managing the evaluation and then we're saying and they're going to take into account all of this other input. We're not actually saying who's evaluating the superintendent or even that, it, that the superintendent is being evaluated. And so I just wonder if there needs to be a little bit more clarity so that that is included. Yeah, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think what I want to do is take out that rather than have the superintendent evaluates, the, the recommended language was they, the, the subcommittee manages the evaluation process. Right. But I'm with you. So do you have any recommended ideas? I mean, that's the point I'm trying, I'm trying to instill. Yeah, I think it just, it just needs to go into that second sentence. So, will you read your second sentence again? The superintendent, the one that I'm adding, the new language? Yeah. The superintendent's, <laughs> what? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. The superintendent's final written evaluation will consider input from all members of the school committee using a formal process to capture members' feedback. I agree with you, it could be better. Yeah. <laughs> now that you've made your point, and, I, and I've read it again. <laughs> yeah. Have you asked the superintendent to offer his thoughts? Uh, I understand the critique that's currently on the table, but um, I think the language that remains from the first sentence mitigates against that to a certain extent because it still um, includes that the process is consistent with state laws and regulations about educator evaluation. And those are self-prescriptive. It tells exactly what the, the superintendent needs to be evaluated on and what the standards for performance are. It still doesn't say who is evaluating. Well, the school committee evaluates. That's by law. So the entire school committee by law evaluates. Um, you have a subcommittee that helps carry it out, but they manage the process. But then ultimately, the full school committee has to approve the evaluation. Well, 
I don't agree with that. I, I think that categorization is a little off because it's it's the um, we all need to approve it per se. But f at least from my three years, it, the the work has been done by the three subcommittee members and the superintendent. And so it's kind of like we we come to consensus. We have a lively discussion. Dr. Provost provides evidence, and then we rate. Um, I think that process could be improved on. I have my own ideas that if I continue to be on the subcommittee, I'll raise those with my colleagues. But ultimately, what, by the time it reaches us, um, there isn't any formal opportunity. I would consider it a formal opportunity for everybody else to give their input that goes into that evaluation that is then shared with John. He is there when we are evaluating him. And whether, there's pros and cons with that, but I wouldn't feel that from what I've heard at least, and I'd like to hear from other committee members, I don't feel like everybody's getting a uh, proper and fair opportunity to be part of the evaluation, particularly their written evaluation. So um, that's my feeling, and I know there's been people that have disagreed with me on it, but I felt with new committee members as well as existing committee members that might have felt this way, I thought it'd be worthwhile to bring it up. Uh, well, I was just going to say I agree. I think we need to, and I've been hoping that the new pilot uh, process from the state might kind of speak to some of this because I think we've had a, by the time it comes to uh, the level of us voting on it or discussing it, and I think we even saw this in our last meeting, it's really so finalized that it's hard to sort of backpedal and really have any kind of meaningful input. And my understanding was is that we are, as a, as a full committee, supposed to have meaningful input. This is really one of the most important jobs that we have is to evaluate the superintendent. That's what I've been taught to believe by MASC. So I like the additional language. I agree also with what Dr. Provost is saying is that the state does prescribe how we look at it, how we evaluate what the system is. So. They, to me, they work well in tandem, having that new sentence along with this uh, clause about the, you know, being consistent with state law and regulations. So it doesn't, it, it just, to me, it kind of further, it clarifies how it's supposed to work. So, Ms. Fallon, did you have a question or are you all set? You had your hand up. I guess it was just a question of um, whether we need to have it, that languaging, whether it's important to the committee that that language be here or whether knowing that we're required by state law to do that, we want to leave the discretion up to the new subcommittee. So I guess if, if we're having trouble deciding on language, I'm worrying if that sentence needs to be in this document, if we're going to have the new subcommittee meeting and deciding it. That was all. It wasn't, it was more of a, do, is it important to have? We, cannot, we can here? amend this at any time. Right. The subcommittee may come back and say we want to further refine that. So that's also a possibility. Ms. Voss. Um, I'm just going to add that I really like the amendment and the extra language, and thank you for figuring out how to word it. Um, I see what um, is being suggested in terms of making it very clear that the committee then evaluates. But I, I do think it's probably okay the way you've worded it, but I'd be open to another phrase if somebody has one. But yeah, I, I really appreciate it. I think my experience has been that um, we should be having a more committee-wide discussion of this and input. And what I'm hearing is the vision is the subcommittee is going to manage the process, figure out the process, but then involve the rest of us in a more meaningful way. And I appreciate that. Mr. Gold? I mean, is it enough to, in 11.1, I mean, keeping the language that's there and just instead of it saying the superintendent evaluation subcommittee annually evaluates, just saying the school committee annually evaluates and then it's not just the subcommittee, it's all of us. And then just putting in a line like you had where it's this process will be managed by the subcommittee or, you know, I mean, because right now it's, it, it starts, it sounds like it's the subcommittee that's evaluating and then also, another, it sounds like there's two evaluators in a way, like the subcommittee's evaluating and then the whole school committee's evaluating. You know, so, I mean, you could just yeah. strike that well, first couple words. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I propose language that might assist with this is to say uh, the super, in, um, say the superintendent evaluation subcommittee manages and executes the school committee's eval annual evaluation of 
um, the superintendent. Mm -hmm. So then that says who's doing it, and it puts the responsibility on the three in the subcommittee, but it also acknowledges that it's the school committee that's doing the evaluation, not the subcommittee. Is that a motion? Yes. Okay. I'm looking for motion to here. amend. Uh, the there's a second. Pending oh. motion. Great. Um, so there's a motion made and seconded, and so that would then be the lead sentence of that. Uh, That's correct. Okay. Any discussion? Is that a friendly on to Lonnie's? I guess it is. <laughs> Sorry, Lonnie. Is that okay? Will you accept yeah. that amendment? I, I think I most definitely will, but okay. you just threw me off by saying that's that's the lead. Isn't that the entire? It sounds like the entire. Is that the entire or it the lead? It wouldn't need to be. I, I like it. It's I'm fine just, for it to be the whole thing. I don't think, I think because we have the subcommittee defined in the section three that you wouldn't need the sentence about the superintendent's final written annual evaluation um, collecting input from the school committee because the first sentence is amended to indicate that the evaluation is done by the whole school committee and um, I also think that that detail can be determined mm -hmm. by the superintendent evaluation committee as discussed also okay so you're gonna so you're ex I guess I'd love to hear somebody read me what 11 actually now would sound like because like, I'm, I'm, I'm like I like what you had, so okay. I, I, I would like to hear it too, but I... Sure, yeah, okay. Go ahead, right, okay. Read. Yeah. So uh, the amendment I'm proposing is uh, the superintendent evaluation subcommittee manages and executes the school committee's annual evaluation process based on, and then as it reads. Superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee manages and executes the school committee's annual superintendent oh, okay. evaluation Sorry. process. Thank you. Okay. Based on mutually agreed upon district goals and then all the way to um, the end of the sentence. Yes, the, to evaluation. Second. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, we sort of got two amendments going here. I just yeah. realized. So, um, yeah. would you withdraw yours, yes. and then we and then we can come back and add to it if you want to add more to the end. Yes, I'll okay. Be, I'll, I'll withdraw my amendment. Okay, great. Um, so, I have questions. Questions about the amendment I or do. comments? So, I agree with what was just read, and my question is, can we then add the final sentence that Mr. Kaufman had already proposed? You could read your to the end of that. Do we need it? I'm not sure. I don't yeah. remember the words. Yeah. We don't need it. I, you know, I, we're getting so into wordsmithing here. I, it, the, to me, this, the, this is a fundamental, important shift, and I feel like people like the idea, so that's what's important for me in raising this, that people want to be part of it, and it's different. And if it's different, that means that this, the evaluation subcommittee will, is charged with coming up with a process, hopefully capitalizing on some really good processes that are in place. Um, I, so I'm not so tied down to it. It sounds like we embrace this. At the same time, we won't all be here next, well, maybe we will in, in <laughs> 10 years. So I don't want to be a stickler for keeping this in here, but I, I just feel like we already followed the law up until now and we weren't doing it in the way that um, we are now deciding to do it. And um, so I'm, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, so do you, but I mean, the question is, do you want to, I mean, you can still add that extra language if you I, want, I, I don't know. I, I'm, okay. I'm gonna, okay. okay. I, I personally would like the sentence in there about um, input from the entire committee. I think it makes it really clear. Um, so if you would read your, Final sentence again, that yeah. would be helpful to The me. superintendent's final written evaluation will consider input from all members of the school committee using a formal process to capture members' feedback. So now I'll ask Ms. Goldman, do you accept that as a friendly amendment to your amendment? I do. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, and that amendment I think was seconded. So um, any further discussion now on the newly reworked section 11? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so thank you for that. 
Um, now on to section 12. Any questions about our quorum? Um, section 13. Okay. Um, section 14. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding 14.1. Uh, has, okay. has, have the dates already been set? Because one of the attachments we received had dates for this year. So we'll be voting on that. That's one of the okay. other organizational items um, that we'll be doing shortly is to approve the calendar of our, of our meetings for the year. So that'll be, um, yeah, uh, set annual meeting schedule. So we'll be taking that up uh, momentarily. Um, so any other in section 14? Okay, section 15. Um, thank you. I, I, I have a question. It's not really a motion at this point, but um, it's, it refers that we use for voting process Robert's Rules of Order Newly Revised, and I am not clear um, how we decide when we do a roll call vote or when we just vote yay, nay, abstain. And in particular, I guess I would like to clarify how we, the order that people get called for the vote. So in some versions of Robert's rules, it cycles um, and starts with the same <coughs> beginning of the alphabet at each meeting. But what that ultimately means is people who have last names at the end of the alphabet never vote first. And people who have last names at the beginning of the alphabet almost always <laughs> use answers, <laughs> for example. <laughs> you know, and I'm not judging either of those, but they're very, unequal experiences and can be helpful or not. Um, but I guess I would like us to um, make that more consistent across. And some of the things that I read about were um, using what, it, they were all within Robert's rules. Um, a, what they call a rising vote where you stand <coughs> a yes, or maybe we just have a systematic way of not always starting the roll call with the first letters and, and really cycling through in the more um, in a more um, consistent way and uh, what we do I don't care but I would like to make it more consistent. Can I ask the clerk? My practice is every time there is a, we don't have an alphabetical order we have on my list is by ward so um, every time there is a roll call vote I start with the next name down and the last roll call that and I cycle around like that. That's the, that's the still leaves the people in the higher wards at the end, but I'm happy to do it another way. But you are cycling, so it's cycling. not the same person I voting. I don't, so I, think same person. I don't think it cycles meeting to meeting, though. Um, I've been on the school committee for two years, and I don't think I've ever voted first, for example. It, it depends you mean, on how you mean continue cycling through. through? So if you're in, you know, over on this side of the room, I guess, I, I you know, Clearly, I don't pay full attention because I didn't realize it was where we sat as opposed to our last name. But um, I think it, it's a very, it's different. Um, so I think it's, a, it's an easy solution. We can cycle not, if you read on about Robert's Rules of Order, sometimes they'll say you agree to start, say, with Word 1 every meeting or you just start with Word 1 on today and for the next two years you just keep track of where you ended and then it will be fair over the course of all the meetings. Do you mean at the next meeting start with Ward 2 and the next Sure. Meeting? Okay. Or, or wherever you ended at the last meeting. Okay. Okay, every time you do a roll call vote, just... Because that sounds like that's what she's doing now within a meeting. Just within a meeting. Which is... Right? And I don't bring the records. But here. when you don't have 9 or 10 roll call votes in a meeting, the people who are 8, 9, 10 never go first. They're always at the end. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. I could... Every time there's a roll call vote, vote, I could start at the beginning of the list for one and the end of the list for the next, and then the second one for the next roll call vote, and then the second to the last for the next call vote. I, so it sounds I'll, like I'll what you I'll make a proposal. Sure. It's very simple. Why don't we just wherever start with Ward 1 in your first roll call vote of the year? Uh, or of the two-year session, and at the end, and do what you're doing now. But at the end of today's meeting, if you end up in Ward Five, um, start the next meeting in Ward Six, okay. and just it, it, that. So you're not going to start with Ward One. You have to just remember where you left the last meeting off, and that would fix it for me. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So that's my motion of people. Okay. Um, I'll second that. Okay. Um, 
because uh, let's see, I'm just trying to see if there is anything about roll call points in our own in our own. Because really, what what no, I think the first section policy that we're supposed to rotate. Them yeah, to find I just want to see if we have that anywhere. Seem to get on the internet. Um, oh. Only because what the section one is saying, or section 15.1 is saying, is that you follow our procedures, but if it's silent, then you follow Robert's rules. Um, so you'd like that? I don't know that we have something specifically about roll call votes. So I'm just wondering where you want you want that put in somewhere. 1512. 1512. Um, in that manner, in the remaining, it, see, it says in that manner in rotating alphabetical order is what our um, rules say now. Um, Although it sounds like that's not even what's been used. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think, um, I, I don't know if it's just the same thing happens on the city council. They go by ward. It's just that sort of the way it's done. I, but it's either or. So, um, but so it sounds like we have we do anticipate a rotation. So that may be where you want to amend it. Sure. So, so saying rotating <coughs> ward order. Fifteen point one two. You can say alphabetical or word. It sounds like we use word, and then it could say the rotation shall occur across meetings or something. Sure. If that's obvious to people, what that means. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on that? Just where do you want the two at large? How do you, as long as how it's do you consistent, do it doesn't matter. Yeah, just yeah. in terms of the wording. Oh, because you. So you're at large. So you're at the end, not because of B, <laughs> but because of at large. Apparently, yeah. I don't know. So they must do the at larges <laughs> after. Awards. Is that how you do it, Annie? Well, that's what how. I mean, I could do it alphabetically. I could easily do it alphabetically, and then. However, you want to do it as okay. far. But I'm just saying your list right now goes. By ward at this ward point, and then at large. Right. Okay. I inherited. The well, no, because the two out larges are—I don't know why they are where they are placed here, but I think <laughs> it's ordering around the room. Right. 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 That. right now, Ronnie's the second, but Susan is the second to last. Okay. I don't know why it was like that before. So just the sheet you inherited. Okay. It's just the sheet. Well, I we can make our own new sheet, everybody. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> do you want to do alphabetical? So. I will propose to move us along. Since it says alphabetical, <coughs> let's leave it alphabetical. Okay. It's not, if we actually rotate like this, it's not going to matter at all, which is the point. Okay. okay, so let's do that. So, so actually, we want to, you're going to leave it and we want to follow that. Yes, okay. and rotate, continuing rotating meeting to meeting. Okay. So that you don't start over at the beginning of each meeting. Okay. So then we're withdrawing the amendment. Well, it doesn't say it. Ending then you just want to make a maybe you just want to modify your amendment then because you originally changed it to ward order and so just so you want to just amend it to add that extra sentence or yes the I, I didn't change it but yes that's fine yes uh, uh, amend 15.12 um, at the end should just say the rotation shall occur across meetings okay, okay. and uh, will someone re-second that again it was seconded second excellent okay um, so all those in favor of that please say aye Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, anything else within <coughs> 15 meeting procedures? Yes. It's just a, I think a Scribner's error, in, or if you want to call it that, but 15.6, uh, I think uh, matter should be matters, shall be allowed on matters, not on the posted agenda mm -hmm. unless they are of an emergency nature. Okay. Is there a second on that? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Just any abstentions? So matter becomes matters. Any other? Okay. Um, 16, open meetings. Uh, 17, uh, special meetings. 18, emergency meetings. Uh, 19, minutes. Uh, 20 executive session minutes and then section 21 is just a superseding you know listing the various um, rules that have been superseded um, which 
this will be added to, I think. Um, so, any other questions? So, we're now then returning to the main motion, which is to approve um, the rules of procedure as amended. Any, any debate or discussion on that? Okay. Should I call a roll call vote? <laughs> no. All those in favor, no, to really confuse Annie. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. So it's unanimously approved. Thank you for all your work on that and uh, bringing those up to date. And uh, so that is the adoption of the rules of procedure. Um, next, we have the election of vice chair um, in accordance with our uh, charter, Article 4, under school committee, vice chair, as soon as practicable after the school committee members elect have been qualified, following the regular city election, the school committee shall organize by electing one of the persons elected as a member of the school committee to serve as school committee vice chair. The school committee vice chair shall preside in the absence of the mayor. Um, so uh, this will be conducted as an election. It's an open election. There are no secret ballots allowed uh, for a public body. So I would open the floor to nominations for vice chair and accept nominations. Are there nominations? Ms. Busansky. I'd like to nominate Lonnie Kaufman. Okay. Are there any other uh, nominations? Yes, Mr. Gold. I'd like to uh, nominate Laura Fallon. Okay. Any other nominations? Okay. Hearing that, none, I will then close uh, the floor to nominations. And I would then ask the um, nominees um, if they wanted to address the school committee and speak about their, um, about their candidacy before we ask the school committee to vote. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, you were nominated first, so I'll turn the floor to you. Sure. <clears throat> I'll say a few words. Um, if, is that okay, Laura? Do you want to do the same? Because if you don't want to, I won't. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, so I, I've, I've been thinking about running for vice chair after receiving um, a lot of encouragement from some colleagues, both current people on the school committee as well as past members, and also from some uh, Northampton educators that um, work in our district and friends. And I, I must say I'm very humbled by the words they shared with me about why I should run um, and what I can bring to the committee. So let me just summarize for you all a few words as to why I'd like to become vice chair. Um, first, um, I, I've been working in public education for about 35 years now in a variety of different um, functions as a practitioner, as a, as a um, researcher, et cetera. Um, and so through that, I have a great amount of experience working um, with other committees and groups as well as our school committee. And I, I think I've been able to really um, see dynamics and, and group dynamics of, of groups that really operate effectively with a lot of trust, with healthy discussions, with healthy debate. Um, truly um, opportunities to reflect on team progress, which is, I think, really important. So I very naturally pay attention to these matters, and I think as vice chair, I kind of see myself helping to establish and support um, these kind of effective group characteristics into our school committee. Um, also, as vice chair, I can absolutely assure you that I will bring an open-mindedness to um, any, any new ideas that people have, big, small, what have you. I mean, I think I think the current role of the school committee, of the vice chair of the school committee, is helping to set the agenda, and certainly I would ensure that new ideas are uh, a part of that to the best of my ability. Uh, I can also see that happening through retreats and other sort of uh, collegial conversations. Um, I want to just focus on a few of my my priorities um, as a school committee member, but how that might reflect on being a vice chair. Um, I, I know that you guys, some of you might be tired of me talking about this, but I am absolutely adamantly focused on uh, becoming more cohesive in how we do our work through um, making efforts to align our, um, our agendas uh, in a manner that gives us time to talk about our district goals and our school committee goals and our superintendent goals and our school improvement plans and our district improvement plans and, and the like. And I think all that, we stand a great, far greater chance to working in a way that our expectations are clear and our time frames are clear and the resources that are necessary are provided to really move us forward. 
Um, so again, I, I, I don't know specifically how that works in terms of how our vice chair can move that forward, because I'll do it regardless. But I do think when you talk about an agenda and you sit down with the mayor and the, and the superintendent, I think I will bring that lens to the table. And I will hope, hopefully bring room in every uh, agenda that we have that we tend to make sure we're focusing on student achievement and we're focusing on our aligned efforts to get there. Um, I'm also, I'll just throw out a couple of ideas. An another idea that I've, uh, about a year ago, I think I discussed with the mayor and I followed up with John. I haven't moved forward with it, but um, as you know, one of the roles of the vice chair is to be the spokesperson. And often that means speaking to the press or not speaking to the press, depending on where you live and, and, and your attitude towards that. But the question I would like for us to explore more so is um, how can we expand our methods of communication with the press? And the real question I have is how can we enhance our communication of important educational matters with the Northampton community? And in what ways can we work with the Gazette or other local papers to help us? Um, I just think that we need to tap into the community more so and that's a challenge. Um, but as one idea I shared previously with, I, I think the mayor actually called me about it that I liked, um, would be maybe the Gazette would be interested in, interested in publishing our agendas um, like they've done in the past and maybe I or somebody can provide a very brief description on important matters within those agendas that might entice or interest some community members to attend our meetings, the public forum aspect to it or get in touch with their school committee members. So I, I want to explore the idea with you all how that can work. Um, I also think our retreats would benefit more from more attention um, responding to the needs and the interests of the school committee members. So I, I think again whether that's setting agenda topics and maybe formats for our retreats um, can be something that uh, either the vice chair or others can be involved with but I want to tackle that issue and I naturally see it probably as a part of the vice chair's responsibilities. Um, and. I guess I just feel like I, I, I want to say that my education and back and my experience in education is quite vast. Um, so I've, I've been a teacher, I've been a counselor, I provided professional development, I was a grant writer, I've evaluated programs, I conducted reviews, I sat on different committees, parent committees, uh, school committees, etc. And this is throughout Massachusetts and New England. Uh, I continue to attend a lot of conferences, I read a lot of educational materials, I think it's important to stay active in the field. Uh, I enjoy doing that and my professional um, responsibilities allow me to do that, to still travel to many districts. Um, and I've certainly, have, within Northampton, I have visited all of our schools, I've attended many school council meetings. Um, I thank ev every teacher in our district each year at our open house for the great work that they do. I hopefully welcome new and existing staff, both here at, on the school committee, but more so um, attending new school open houses, uh, new school year open houses and new school year days, inauguration days, the first day of school. Convocation. Thank you. Um, I march each year in the Pride Parade. I march each, each year in the Memorial Day Parade. I feel it's really important for public officials to do that. I welcome m more of you out there. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's really different marching than attending, but it's a good, um, it's a, it's a good opportunity. So um, these, are, these are the reasons I'm interested in, and I thank you for nominating me, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Ms. Fallon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm prepared now. Um, so I have four children currently enrolled in the Northampton Public Schools, one at Jackson Street, two at JFK, and one at the high school. Um, I feel like that gives me a fairly broad perspective on what's going on at every level of our district, um, and it affords me the opportunity to be in contact with a really large number of students and parents and teachers and community members. Um, and years of, well, more than a decade of experience um, trying to do, uh, trying to get four really unique uh, individuals to agree on everything from what's for dinner to which movie are we gonna watch. <laughs> um, I feel like I've really, really any decision, um, have honed my skills as far as patience, flexibility, and consensus building, which I think would be really important for a school committee. Um, uh, since I was sworn in as a school committee member um, over five years ago, I've availed myself of literally every possible professional development opportunity available. I have been to conferences, meetings, uh, symposiums, institutes, um, conventions, um, 
input seminars offered by the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, by the National School Board Association, by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and even by the State Senate. I attended there. I was invited by Senator Rosenberg to attend their Citizens Legislative Seminar for two days so that I really understood the entire process from beginning to end of how our laws are enacted and, and could be a more effective advocate for our schools. Um, so I've been working so hard to try and learn as much as I possibly could about um, policy, advocacy, funding, um, best practices uh, for school committee members, trends in education, um, best practice in education, um, state and federal laws, um, you name it. I feel like I'm a work in progress and I will continue doing um, as much work as I can and I hope to be a resource to you. Um, as I've learned, I've gradually taken on more leadership responsibilities. I've served as the chair of the Rules and Policy Committee for four years now. Um, I have um, recently, in October, I was um, one of the three people elected by the more than 30 school committee members that serve on the board of directors of the Collaborative for Educational Services um, to be um, on their executive committee, um, which allowed, they entrusted me with the responsibility of voting for the entire group in the absence of a quorum or if there needs to be emergency action taken in between meetings. Um, in this November, I was honored to have been elected by my peers at the statewide conference in Hyannis um, to represent all of the school committee members serving um, all 48 school districts making up Division 5 of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Association of School Committees. It's the Connecticut Valley, essentially down from from Longmeadow up to um, all the way north past Orange. Um, as a result, I, I started my term this past weekend um, on a two-year term on the board of directors of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Um, and as a result, I'll be participating in a lot more professional development and um, leadership training um, beginning as soon as this month. Um, I'll be one of the representatives traveling to Washington, D.C. at the end of the month also um, for the, um, as a part member of the Federal Relations Network for the um, National School Boards Association. And so I'll be attending their equity symposium and then their Federal Advocacy um, tr Institute. Um, as the mayor mentioned, the primary responsibilities of the vice chair are to preside over meetings. Um, and to serve as an official spokesperson for the committee and help set the agenda. Um, in over five years as a member of this Northampton School Committee, I've missed one meeting ever. I've never missed a subcommittee meeting and I have been um, present at uh, all but one of the full committee meetings. So I feel pretty confident that I could preside in the absence of the mayor if necessary. Um, uh, I take the school committee member uh, code of ethics very seriously. If I were to serve as your spokesperson, I would be very, I can assure you I'd be very serious about representing the views of the committee, um, even when they don't coincide with my own personal views. Um, and I think that's an important thing to know. Uh, regard, regarding agenda setting, um, I firmly believe the agenda belongs to the committee as a whole. Um, and I think I've made that clear over the past few months. I've brought forth um, some ideas or alternative ways of setting the agenda so that the process would be more collaborative and more transparent. Um, I really think there are ways that we could improve our agenda setting and that we could be more focused um, in our work. As a result of that, I am lucky that I have contact now with so many school committee members from all over the state and I know this is one area where it, there's huge variation. Some committees are setting a year-long agenda, so you have all the time to prepare. You know what you're going to have on your agenda when as far as presentations and votes, and I think that that's, you know, those types of ideas are things that we should be considering. Um, I think that, um, that there are so many options out there, and it's just what, what we decide fits best. Um, we talked at the retreat. Um, I think I made it clear that I think that uh, we should, in fact, be looking at everything that comes before us as does this, is this something that as a group, I think time is an important commodity, is this something as a group that we want to um, use the resource of time to give our attention to? And does this fit in with our goals? Is this aligned with our vision? Is this aligned with our district improvement plan? So I've been um, very interested in vertical alignment of our goals as well. Um, I understand the role of the vice chair to be that of servant to the assembly, and I would just hope that I could serve as a resource for members, both new and returning. 
um, I guess, um, finally, despite the composition of this group, it's been a decade since we've had a female service of vice chair. Um, you have a qualified, highly qualified candidate here tonight asking for the privilege of filling that role. Um, I hope that you would take this opportunity to show our students, our district, and our community that you believe in the value of women in leadership positions, not just in theory, but in action, uh, by casting your vote on my behalf. Um, and finally, I've, I've had the opportunity to meet with all of the new members, um, most of you more than once now, um, in an effort to welcome you, to answer questions, um, and to begin building relationships. Um, I've been really impressed by each and every one of you, and regardless of the, I know it's a lot of pressure that this is one of your first big votes, so I do want to say regardless of the outcome of the vote, I'm really excited um, to be working with you all and our returning members, and I'm really looking forward to this new term, so, so thank you. So thank you to both of the uh, candidates for your remarks. Um, does anyone else wish to add anything? This is a time if anyone wants to add anything or speak in, uh, on behalf of a candidate or add anything to the remarks that have already been given. Okay. Hearing none then, I will, um, this will be a roll call vote. And um, what I will do is when you, uh, when your name is called, I would ask you to name the person that you select uh, to be our vice chair. How does it work in terms of numbers with the voting? Exactly. Sorry if I should know this. Like, is it just the majority if it's five? Five. It's a majority. Yes, it's a majority. Uh, a majority vote. And so, if There's it no is five five, then what does? Uh, if it's five five, then we would need to um, uh, continue to vote until we elect a um, until we elect a vice chair. So that would be. Hopefully, we won't. Yeah, we would just we would have to keep voting. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Mayor, do you vote in this election? I am a voting member. So yes. then it would not be 5-5 unless one person abstained? Mm -hmm. Ten members. Ten the superintendent does not. Uh, apologies. No, no problem. <laughs> yeah, it is an oddity we are a ten-member body. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the uh, process. And <coughs> so I would ask the clerk to call the roll. Ms. Susan Voss? Mm -hmm. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman. Mr. Sean Condon? Uh, Ms. Fallon? Ms. Fallon? Mr. Ryan Gold? Um, Ms. Fallon? Ms. Rebecca Kostansky? Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Ms. Lloyd Fallon? Oh, are they voting? Can they vote? Yeah, yeah. They can certainly vote. Uh, Ms. Fallon? <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Dale Levy? I vote for both people. <laughs> um, Lonnie Kaufman. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman. Uh, Mr. Kaufman. Ms. Kai Goldman. Mr. Kaufman. Ms. Emily Sergey Kaufman. Mr. Kaufman. Uh, six votes for Mr. Kaufman and five votes for Ms. Kaufman. Congratulations to Mr. Kaufman. Four. It has to be four vote. It's only ten votes total. Oh, I'm sorry. Or it has to be five. Something's off. Oh, uh, there's something off. So I think there's four. Okay. Excuse me. Four. Yeah, there's four for Ms. Fallon and six. Votes. So the so Mr. Kaufman is elected six to four. Congratulations, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, sir. Or Mr. Vice Chair. Excuse me. <laughs> um. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I appreciate this opportunity. If it wasn't clear already, I don't, I, this is, it's not really a, an election. You go out and you nominate yourself for and you recruit votes. At least I didn't do that. So uh, this is nothing like competing against Laura. I, I have an incredible admiration for you. I'm so happy that you've decided to continue. My other four colleagues, uh, we don't have them and you bring all the historical knowledge. And um, as you know, I'm very, um, complimentary of all the work you do for us. I've told, you that, told that to you personally and out loud, so I will hopefully you can continue to help me in this role. And um, for everybody else, um, I'm ready to move ahead. As Laura said, I'm really excited by this new group of folks, and um, I think the idea that everybody's open to new ideas is gonna be a really exciting time for us, um, and I think we are ready to get started, so thank you. Excellent. 
So the next matter um, as part of our organization is the election of executive secretary, um, which is uh, Actually, nomenclature for the superintendent is our executive serves as our executive secretary, um, and so um, could I have a motion to elect uh, Superintendent Provost as our executive secretary? So moved. Okay. <laughs> is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, any further discussion on that? Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, and then final, the final act of our organizational meeting is to set the annual meeting schedule. Um, and a, a proposed meeting schedule is in your packet. Um, I think as uh, was pointed out, our primary responsibility as a school committee is to make sure, oh, well, this is, a, this is that, that we've, we've, we've laid out essentially the, um, the meetings that we have on the, um, Thursdays, but we also have set aside meetings during budget season, additional meetings during budget season, and then we've set aside additional meetings for the evaluative um, uh, meetings where we look at things like our MCAS scores or we look at, so we've tried to set aside meetings um, so that we could just focus on student achievement as Mr. Kaufman had um, stated. So those are the, um, that's the pattern that we used during the last term and this I think mirrors that as well. Are there any questions about the um, calendar? Is there a motion to approve the meeting? Or I can wait till the discussion. <coughs> so would you just make a motion? To uh, motion to approve <coughs> the school committee regular meeting schedule. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Ms. Busanski. So the um, Thursday, April 9th meeting, the, which is our final budget vote, falls on the second night of Passover, which is, uh, well, I will not be able to attend that night, and I think it might be prohibitive for others, so I had emailed with the superintendent earlier and um, uh, well you could speak for yourself but I think we agreed that Tuesday I'd like to propose Tuesday April 7th instead of Thursday April 9th for that meeting only okay so um, hmm? well, if there's somebody else clerk that date okay. I won't be able to make it <laughs> <laughs> We'll make, we'll make accommodations. Okay. So um, could you just repeat the date one more time? Uh, Tuesday, April 7th. Okay, April 7th. Uh, we had, I had also considered uh, or put out, you know, moving it to the following Thursday, but that would be April 14th, and we need to sign off on the budget by the 15th, and so it feels just a little too close. Is that right, Superintendent? That's correct. I mean, actually, the first potential vote for the budget is March 26th, so the, the first meeting in April is a backup vote date, um, which if it was the 7th or the 9th, would give us another opportunity to schedule an emergency meeting if we had a backup vote that failed. If we go to the 14th, then it has to pass on the 14th no matter what. Okay. okay. So that's the thinking behind it, behind the 7th. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second. Okay. To change our April 9th meeting <coughs> 7th, that Tuesday. I would just like to clarify, I assume we would also change the student advisory committee meeting as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's all inclusive of both of those. Yes. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that is... Um, are there any other questions about the meeting schedule? Yes, Ms. Busanski. <laughs> so the Thursday, April 23rd, I just want to point out is during the April vacation week, which I don't think precludes having a meeting on that night. I just want to sort of put that, make note of that for folks. And I think the superintendent, do you agree that we could go ahead with that meeting? On that I day? do. Um, actually, we used to have the meeting in February and the meeting in April, both on school vacation weeks. Um, but. There was a, a time when we had somewhat of a controversial discussion about the budget during the February vacation, and that um, that created some sensitivities for some of our employees. And so from that point, we made the decision to not hold the February budget discussion during February vacation. But that doesn't change any of the other uh, meetings that, that do take place during vacation, including all the meetings that take place during the summer. 
Ms. Fox. I mean, I'll just put out there, it, is there a reason to not consider that second meeting the 30th instead of the 23rd just because it's an important discussion. It's on here as the district review report and just thinking of the public who might be out of town since it is school vacation week, people would have less access to to it. Yeah, there's no reason not to go with any other date. It's just that uh, the, the April 23rd meeting isn't subject to the same kind of sensitivity that the February <coughs> So do you want to, are you proposing a change? Yeah, I'll propose, uh, unless somebody has a reason not to, changing <laughs> it to the 30th, just to make it more available to people. Okay, is there a second on that? Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor of that amendment, please say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, any other, um, any other comments or edits to the calendar? Okay. Um, hearing none, then, is there a uh, call of uh, <coughs> approving the uh, 2020 school committee meeting uh, schedule? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so our annual meeting schedule has been concluded, um, and that concludes the um, four organizational votes that we need to take um, as a school committee. And so now we'll move on with regular um, regular agenda and we move to the public comment period um, so I do have a sign-up sheet here um, which uh, folks signed up earlier um, the first person who has signed up is Kira Henninger okay. um, I'm if you could just state your name um, and address for the record, and I'll be um, keeping a three-minute timer just to make sure that everyone has an equal amount of time. Thank you. Um, my name is Hannah Christick. I live at 70 Straw Ave in Florence. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Leeds, and I am reading on behalf of Dr. Henninger, who had to leave. My name is Kira Henninger. I'm an East Hampton resident, and I am the school psychologist at Leeds Elementary School. I have been a school psychologist for 10 years, these last five years at Leeds. I want to speak tonight to introduce myself and to welcome the new school committee members. You are most likely aware of the tension and mistrust that developed between Northampton school employees and the school committee last year through contract negotiations. You may not be aware, but this tension and mistrust still lingers. I am amazed at the time, energy, and effort that my colleagues put in every day for their students and their students' families, but this is not sustainable. Teachers and staff are asked to take on more and more while being provided less and less in terms of training, support, and resources. I simultaneously worry about the well-being of my colleagues and whether or not we are going to be able to meet the increasing needs of our students. I'm grateful to our new principal, Ms. Wenz, who has jumped right in and worked collaboratively with staff. I am aware that the financial stress Northampton Schools is facing is not unique to us and that many public schools are facing similar stress. I am hopeful that our relationship with the school committee can be repaired over time by working collaboratively. In order <coughs> for that to happen, you will need to engage yourself in our schools, spend time talking to teachers and staff, listen to successes as well as the challenges, and really understand the structures and systems in place. You will need to use what you learn to inform the decisions you make and think critically about how your decisions will impact students and the people who serve them. In my experience, you can't please everyone. There will always be someone or a small group of people that are unhappy with your decisions, but I've also learned that you are never wrong when you make decisions in the best interest of kids. Although last year was stressful for all school employees, one benefit was how we all came together and have been much more engaged members of the union. We are aware that our voice needs to be included more in the decision-making process. I am no longer a passive employee. I have a lot of questions about why certain decisions were made in the past and for whose <coughs> benefit. I encourage you to ask questions too. And if you are not satisfied with the answers to your questions, I encourage you to push for change. I realize all of you hold political positions, but when you are faced with decisions to make, 
I encourage you to make decisions based on what is best for kids in our community instead of political decisions. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to collaborating with all of you. The uh, next person who is signed up is Andrea Agito. Good evening. My name is Andrea Egito, and I am the Unit A Chapter Coordinator for the Northampton Association of School Employees. I represent all licensed staff in our district, including but not limited to teachers, librarians, guidance counselors, academic coaches, nurses, school psychologists, adjustment counselors, social workers, speech and language pathologists, physical therapists, and occupational therapists. On behalf of everyone at NACE, I would like to congratulate you all on your election to this, being elected to this office. And um, we look forward to working together to make our district the best that it can be. A district where all employees are respected and all our children's needs are met. On April 26th, our school employees, that was the first day of school, our school employees almost unanimously voted to ratify all six contracts for the Northampton Public Schools. The ratification of our tentative agreement has been lost in some kind of vortex somewhere out in the ethers. So in addition to welcoming you all, and congratulating you and expressing our interest in working collaboratively together, as Dr. Henninger said so eloquently, I would also implore you to find out where those contracts are and why the school committee hasn't signed them yet. Because we've been waiting after what was a long fight to be able to start to repair our relationships and start to move forward in the work of educating the students of Northampton. So I would respectfully request that you ask those questions and find out and hopefully get the contract signed at long last. Um, and I would also like to invite you all into our schools. Please come and come often. Talk with our staff, talk with our families, talk with our kids. It's really important and I think it's also important for you to go into schools that are not necessarily the schools that you are directly connected to, either through your own children or through your neighbor's children. Um, come to all of them. It's important. And you will learn more from being in our buildings than you really could learn um, in sitting in this forum. Thank you so much, and again, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the next person who signed up is Cynthia Swopsis. Thank you. I'm Cynthia Swopsis, and I reside at 120 Coles Meadow Road in Northampton. I want to thank you all. I've been here for an hour and a half. You're all very dedicated, and I really appreciate that. I'm a member of the city's Board of Health, and I also served on the city council's select subcommittee on pesticides. We were advised, our, I was the vice chair of that committee, and we were advised that the city council did not have jurisdiction over school property, so I'm happy you are considering a proposal to review this issue in your, what I think is the budget and property subcommittee. Um, I want to provide you with some facts to consider as you review the use of pesticides on school property. These are some of the things that we found out in our subcommittee. Uh, every educational institution in this state has to file an integrated pest management um, plan. There are 93 of them in the city of Northampton. Fortunately, you won't have to review all of those. Um, but this is, this is available on the website to the public, so you can easily view these. <clears throat> of particular concern in the review that was documented in our group is the use of glyphosate, otherwise known as Roundup, on our school property, particularly the middle school and the high school. The rationale for using glyphosate is weed control. During our interviews with city departments, we discovered there is a social and cultural pride 
in our, particularly the high school athletic field. It's regarded as one of the best in the area. So I hope your review of pesticides or on the playing fields in Northampton takes into consideration the frequency and the purpose of chemicals in relationship to the health of our kids who play and compete on these fields. I would encourage you to compare the city's use of glyphosate in surrounding towns such as East Hampton and Amherst where their integrated pest management plans state that the use of pesticides on any school property is non-existent. And finally, I would be the first to admit to anyone here that you can purchase a gallon of Roundup at your local Walmart. The science around the use of glyphosate or Roundup is um, firmly con is, is a little sketchy, but it is confirmed that there is some kind of a link between animal, human, and health effects and Roundup. So we just don't know the amounts. We don't know the level of exposure and the time it takes for these chemicals to dissipate. In my world of public health practice, when we have evidence that suggests a harmful effect on human health, we move to a practice called the precautionary principle, something similar to what we did with the use of vaping here in the state. And this principle is a strategy for approaching issues of potential harm when extensive scientific knowledge on the matter is lacking. These protections should be relaxed only if further scientific findings emerge that provide sound evidence that no harm will result. So I would request your review of pesticides on school property in Northampton. Take into consideration the precautionary principle and the practices in our surrounding communities, cities, and towns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Those were the only three folks who signed up. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment this evening? Yes, ma'am, if you could just um, come to the podium and state your name and press. Hi, I'm Amy Martin. I live at 17 Federal Street. Um, I have a daughter at the high school now, went to JFK, and really, uh, you just said everything I was going to say much better than I could say it because you were on that committee. But just as a parent, um, as somebody who lives in the community, who actually lives in our backyard, uh, is on uh, abuts the high school grounds. So another reason I'm interested, many of us, you know, live in close quarters to all of the school property. Um, absolutely, it's, it seems like a no-brainer. I certainly hope that you will. Um, you know, send this to subcommittee and, and take action to eliminate the use of pesticides as all of the surrounding towns have done. So thank you for considering that. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, um, seeing none, I will uh, close the public comment period. Um, we now have time reserved for announcements uh, by members of the school committee. Are there any announcements that people would like to make? Ms. Fallon. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, the collaborative is hosting um, a conference called Transforming Education for Social Justice on March 14th um, between 8.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. Um, and uh, participants and speakers will co-create a space for young people, educators, activists, administrators, and scholars to connect and network, share and learn, dream and envision possibilities for developing education as a tool for equity and social justice. Um, the goal is to have students be able to attend for free, um, and so they did sell out, the conference sold out last year, so if anyone's interested, um, I would get on that early. Uh, more information is available on the Collaborative's website. Um, it's just collaborative.org. Yes, Ms. Voss. Um, I just wanted to remind people that next Tuesday, January 14th, the CPAC will be hosting a listening session with Dr. Provost and Dr. Plummer and some of the other student services professionals um, in this room, 630. Thank you. I did want to announce that um, uh, today I, I um, released a schedule of seven upcoming uh, town hall meetings that I'll be holding city beginning um, beginning next week uh, and these are for the purpose of discussing the proposed uh, proposition two and a half override on March 3rd uh, 2020 um, we've scheduled them in every ward in the city um, and uh, in some of them are in our schools um, as well as at the Florence Civic Center and the Senior Center and I will send out that schedule to all of you um, 
tomorrow so that you have it. And, um, it's on social media. It's on the city's website. And I would just encourage you to share it with your, um, with your constituents and your networks so that we can have as many people as possible be there to ask questions and be part of the conversation. So thank you. Any other announcements? Okay, so now we move into the um, recommended actions. This is our consent agenda. Um, we actually do not have um, uh, minutes of the December 12th, 2019 school committee, um, also known as the seven hour marathon uh, that we <laughs> closed out the um, closed out the year with. Um, uh, we do have some budget transfers and we have two field trip requests, the Bridge Street School Grade 5 Nature's Classroom uh, trip uh, to Colebrook, Connecticut on March 30th through April 2nd, and then the NHS band trip to Washington, D.C. Um, April 2nd through the 5th, 2020. Um, I would entertain a motion on the consent agenda um, minus those minutes which were not available. Is there a second? Is there a motion, first of all? Motion. motion. Oh. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So, the consent agenda um, is approved. <coughs> now we'll move to reports and recommendations, and we'll begin with a report from our student representative, Eleanor Hart. <coughs> Hi, everybody. Um, just to introduce myself to the new members, I'm Eleanor. I'm a senior at North Haven High School, and I'm representative from the Student Union, which is a group of elected students that represents the student body while, um, and talks with administration and obviously the school committee just um, about certain different issues that the, student, that the students want to work on and, and change. Um, so yeah, um, anyways. To get on with the report, um, we only were able to have one meeting in December just because of the holiday season. So um, we've only had one meeting since the last school committee meeting. So I don't have a lot to talk about. Um, but last night we had a really great conversation with Ananda Lennox um, about vaping at the high school. Um, and so we we're really excited to be able to finally meet with her and our hoping to you know, work more collaboratively with her in the future. Uh, we talked about a lot of different things. Um, I think specifically about you know, how we can kind of like, we're really interested in working on kind of a balance between punishment and help for students, which I think we've talked about um, throughout the past couple of months. And, and so you know, we're trying to figure out as a student union and I think just generally, you know, what is the best way for you know, the students to be helped because it is a really big health issue um, and a lot of our students are addicted to nicotine um, and yeah, so we talked about, um, you know, just a bunch of different things like, you know, spreading more information and possibly like putting plexiglass <laughs> over the posters so that they can't be taken down, or maybe having like a confidential adult in the building to go for students to go talk to um, so they wouldn't feel, just so they could feel heard and to have a, a person to go to um, who they feel safe talking to, or maybe a social media campaign, um, different things like that. So I mean, we'll see what happens in the near future. Um, our plan right now is to just kind of meet with Ms. Valancourt and Ms. Sheridan and the school nurse possibly, possibly with Ms. Goodwin Boyd um, at the high school who works in the guidance department and, and just to kind of meet with them and talk more like directly about the vaping issue and what we can do. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your report. Next we have a vote on the approval of the 2020 uh, school calendar um, and I it's actually 2020 2021 correct the mm -hmm. the next um, school calendar um, and I would ask Dr. Provost to um, give a presentation on that before we vote sure directing your attention to your packets you'll see a copy of the draft calendar for next year it speaks for itself so just to mention a few of the highlights 
August 31st will be convocation day. The first teacher work day, or, or the uh, September 1st would be a teacher work day after convocation. And the first day for students would be September 2nd. The last day of school would be June 17th. That leaves us plenty of days for uh, makeup for snow or other inclement weather events. And this comports with all of the requirements of the collective bargaining agreements. It also meets all state requirements. And so it's our recommended calendar for you for the next year. Okay. Would someone make a motion to approve that calendar for purposes of discussion? Motion to approve the school calendar. Is there a second? Second. Is there any, are there any questions or discussion about the calendar? Oh yes, Mr. Gold. Um, I'm sure a whole lot of work has gone into this, so, but something from my lens as a classroom teacher is, um, in October there's, um, that, there's a professional development day on the 6th and then there's no school on the 12th, giving like a choppy two week window and I mean, I, Maybe you've already contacted teachers and it's something or you figured out, but I just feel like the consistency that it gives you to have a full week of school, like if that professional development day was either, you know, on the 13th, for instance, for students and teachers, it just gives a little bit more consistency than having a, you know, a three day weekend and a couple of days and another day. So I wonder what more curious what the thought process is around that. Sure. Uh, so there are a couple of constraints in the CBA. One has to do with making sure that there is uh, a certain number of either early release days or full professional development days and they need to be spaced out uh, according to a certain sequence so that um, there are regular intervals of breaks for educators. Uh, this is something that we made as a, as a change from our first draft in the first um, version of this, we had that full day off. The sixth was in September, and we had a half release day in um, October. Um, but one of the things that um, we ended up changing was to sync up the half release day to September 28th, which is going to be Yom Kippur which will be um, beneficial, we think, to students who are attending services that day. So they'll have an opportunity to miss only a half day instead of a full day of school. Um, this is uh, an idea we actually got from some of our colleagues in a neighboring district where students um, actually made the same sort of request whenever possible. If it was possible to sync up the, the early release days with uh, holy days, so we made that change. So that's, that's how that happened. Those are the main factors that went into effect with that. Can I, can I, again, from a school teacher perspective, uh, having it on a Tuesday, you know, coming back from a weekend, having a full day of school, then a day off, then three days, then a long weekend, could that six, that full day be moved to one end of the week, a Monday or a Friday maybe? So that also is responding to another uh, piece of feedback we got, which was um, concerns from parents that having these half days moving all over <coughs> different times of the week was difficult for them to arrange childcare. So one of the days that we know is set is election day, which is Tuesday. So we tried to make the rest of the days Tuesday to the certain, to the extent possible. Um, so the 6th, if, if having the 6th and the 12th on consecutive weeks is problematic, um, one of the things that we could potentially do is move the professional development day from October 6th to October 27th. That would make sure that you don't have two consecutive weeks with a full day's break, but then that introduces another issue, which is that it'll be another full month before we de deliver whatever professional development we're going to do on that day. Yes. Um, I have two questions. Can you speak to why Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are not school holidays? And then can you also speak to why election day is? And I'll, and I'll just clarify with my, my second question that one of the things I heard over and over from folks on the campaign trail 
was how hard it was that it felt like there were so many days for parents to find childcare, and there was just confusion there. So simply having an understanding would be helpful. So uh, the assessment that districts look at in terms of religious holidays really has to do around the attendance of their students. And every year we do take a look at the Jewish holidays and what student attendance is like compared to other days. We don't, we don't um, see a really significant change on student attendance in those days. So to give you uh, just sort of a comparison, in another district I've worked in with a primarily Hispanic and Latino population, uh, the, the attendance on Three Kings Day was almost zero. So that had to become a holiday. Um, we don't have that same kind of uh, scenario happening in, in Northampton, which is why those are not holidays. Well, and in this particular calendar, there's only one Jewish holiday that happens to fall on a on a school day. The other one is on is on a weekend. So that's that. Why election day is? Um, it's because of the amount of traffic in the buildings which are used as polling places, and it has to get to student security. We don't close schools when we have primaries because they're not as well, um, they're not as well attended by voters, and we have an ability to uh, maintain decent security for students. But on a regular election day, um, and our schools that are used as polling places, there are many people in and out of the building, and it's, it's a potential security risk. Uh, of course, not all of our schools are, are polling places, but we do try to keep our schools synced up to the same schedule. Actually, the item that's coming up next is an attempt to resync our schools to the same schedule because we had, um, we had two schools that are, are now behind today because they had mechanical failures. So um, in the event that we tried to run school on a election day, I think we would have to only open those schools that weren't used as polling places, and then we'd have to schedule makeup days for the schools that were polling places. So I, I would, I think it would be really interesting to see some data on that, only because I know a number of districts where schools are polling places and they've found ways to use specific entrances for voting and to have security be secure. Um, I also, from an equity and inclusion standpoint, want to encourage the district to think about the message that's sent, um, regardless of numbers of students' attendance, um, with the just the message that gets sent about about um, um, prioritizing certain religions over others uh, by having certain holidays that are the most holy for specific religions not observed by a school district. Um, I'd like to hear, I, this is interesting to hear from the teachers on the committee about just multiple days off in consecutive weeks. It makes a lot of sense. I hadn't thought about it. But when, Dr. Provost, when this calendar gets put together, how much input do we get from our teachers and have they expressed that concern and how does it come about? Wh what is their typical input into this? Well, I think the main, the main piece of teacher input into the calendar has to do with the, the collective bargaining process because many of the components of the calendar are specified in the CBA. Um, so there's extensive discussion of that. As um, you know, there's been discussion the last two negotiation cycles around the elementary conferences at the end of October, for example. Um, with respect to the actual final version of the calendar, or the this calendar that you see in front of you before you receive it, it goes to the NACE executive board and they take a look at it. Um, so they have an opportunity not only to look at sort of what are the parameters and what will we allow for a school calendar, but also they see each individual iteration of the school calendar and make um, comments on it before it comes to the school. We did actually make one change to this calendar based on input from NACE, which was to switch the convocation day and the uh, teacher work day on August 3rd, <coughs> September 1st. Just, I understand why you're saying you've gotten feedback, it's hard to find childcare, so if you keep some of the days consistent, for example, on Tuesday, that might be helpful. But I'll just put out there, I suspect there's also families who, um, you know, 
work certain days and don't work other days. And so I could make a similar argument for mixing these days up so that it doesn't hit the same families in a hard way every single time. So I don't know how extensive the research was, but if it was just a couple people saying that, I wouldn't necessarily want to just go on that. Just a comment. Sure. And so just to follow up on that October 6th one, now in January, it is lined up, if I'm seeing it correctly, where there's a teacher work day, the weekend, and then a national holiday, so that there isn't that interruption necessarily of teach, day off, you teach. And also, potentially for families, you can plan for a four-day weekend versus planning for a regular weekend and then back, and then there's a day there. So I guess that's what I was thinking about with that October piece, but. So moving into the ninth? Um, if that was, yeah, if that was something that worked out for the, you know, there's a lot, I'm, there's probably a ton be more than I'm aware of, so you might know more than I do, but no. you shouldn't probably. Yeah. No, there, the, only, the only complication about moving it to the ninth, which does, would mirror what's happening in January, as you point out, is that we'd be moving away We'd be just be moving away from trying to keep things lined up with the Tuesdays. So, you know that that's something we're trying for the first time this year. I don't think that it would be a a, a horrible change to move it to the ninth. Um, I just want to point out that the reason we did it was because we were trying to respond to some feedback, not extensive, but some feedback we had gotten from the community saying, "Can you please try to keep these things on the same day?" Ms. Voss. I I think I just want to. We've been through this with the January, just so people know. The high school finals um, happen that week, bef earlier in that week before the 15th, and the teachers need that 15th to turn the classrooms around for the second semester. So that there was a calendar two years ago where it didn't look like that, and we got feedback that it would be very helpful for them to have that four-day, um, as you're saying. And so that, that particular four-day weekend, I think, is partly around the turnover day at the high school, maybe among other things too. So I guess I just want to, were you, were you um, entertaining a change or are you concerned about making a change or I'm just trying to understand what you prefer the committee to do? I'm actually uh, very comfortable with making the change from the 6th to the 9th in October, but I think maybe just to clarify the purpose of the vote. Um, the committee's role here is not to go through the entire calendar and make changes in the individual dates. It's just to verify, as I put in the email, that it meets the requirements for the state and it also meets the requirement for our CBAs. I love the feedback and I think that that change of moving from the 6th to the 9th is a good one to make. But um, <coughs> I don't think that needs to be made in the form of a motion. Okay. It could be made that Yes, we agree these are the number of days and strongly encourage the superintendent to, to move that day from the 6th to the 9th. Okay. Okay. Any other, um, any other ideas or, or comments? Okay. So the calendar was moved and seconded. Um, and so um, you'll, you, you'll, in our approving it, you'll, it's understood that you'll look at that October alignment mm -hmm. then. Yep. Okay. So all those in favor of approving the calendar, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is um, approved. Next we have a report from the superintendent on the makeup day for Jackson Street School and JFK Middle School. Yes, and this gets back to what we were discussing a little bit with respect to election day. Um, so we did have one day when Jackson Street was not able to hold school because there was um, an accident or, or something that happened in the neighborhood that caused loss of power, loss of gas, um, and also caused the road leading to the school to be closed. So that was one of the easiest school closure decisions I ever made. Um, <laughs> And then we had the uh, failure at JFK, which, well, I have before, just throw in um, 
for the new members who may not have been a part of this communication. That actually turned out to be related to a software error, which led our boilers to think that it was feeding hot water to three of our registers that actually weren't receiving hot water, which is what caused them to burst. Um, but the, uh, the company has been good about accepting responsibility for that, so they're taking care of the portion that would be well, basically taking care of it, all of the costs that we were associated with that. Anyways, that now leaves Jackson Street and JFK out of sync with the rest of the, the district. Um, when Jackson Street had its incident, which was the first one, I did uh, petition the commissioner for a waiver of the 180-day um, requirement and received a very clear response that 180 days is 180 days and you need to get them in no matter what. Um, so uh, when JFK had its problem, I did not want to pester the commissioner with another appeal. Um, so we basically had two options that I discussed with the executive board for NACE. Um, one was just adding an additional makeup day at the end of the year for those two schools. Um, as we would, it would be like a snow day, but only for those schools. The other was making the turnaround day that we were just discussing, which is January 17th, a half day for those two schools. So it's currently scheduled as a, a teacher work day for all teachers, but in those two schools, it would be a half day instead, and then teachers would get a half um, work day. And that was seen as preferable to them going all the way to the end of the year. And I, I think that was a very wise choice. I'm not surprised that that's what the teachers selected. My suspicion is that if we tacked one more day onto the end of the year, a half day onto the end of the year, we would have extremely low attendance by both students and staff, most likely. So uh, I think this is a good way to make it up. So I've already notified the parents this doesn't require a vote. It's just informational to the committee, and that will be taking place in the future. <coughs> about that okay um, next we have a report on the JFK turnaround grant um, from uh, Leslie Wilson and David Messing <laughs> Uh, so tonight we just are here to share some information, some good news. Um, we are pleased to share that we received a $20,000 turnaround grant as part of an application to support our turnaround plan um, for our efforts to improve the achievement and attendance of our English learners and our former English learners. Um, I'm also pleased to report that in our first year of efforts, even before we wrote our turnaround plan, that we did um, have much success and saw much improvement um, for our English learners and our former English learners. Um, this all comes back to 2018 when we were identified um, by the state um, in need of focused, targeted support due to low um, subgroup performance for our L's and our FELs, and that was in ELA Math Science MCAS. And um, for chronic absenteeism. So that kind of launched us into writing a turnaround plan, um, which we did with support from the statewide system of support um, with the DESI, um, with some DESI support. Um, we finalized our plan in June of 2019, and it was approved in the fall of 2020. Uh, in writing the plan, we engaged our um, second language um, teachers, we engaged our stakeholders, our department chairs, our team leaders, faculty with an envisioning protocol, setting some goals and a very clear vision for improvement for our students. Um, we are um, ESL teachers were instrumental in um, developing the plan with us, as were a lot of district administrators. And we, uh, our plan was approved this fall, but we did kind of launch ourselves into implementing our turnaround practices um, before this fall. And um, we received a $10,000 grant last year um, 
and we use that for professional development workshops for teachers. Lauren Berry and Michelle Emanation are um, ESL teachers at JFK, along with uh, Albert Moussad, ran a lot of professional development, um, really kind of uh, focusing on the um, sheltered English immersion um, professional development that teachers already had. Uh, we did a lot of um, coaching and walkthroughs. Uh, Albert also helped with um, doing some coaching and some walkthroughs and then um, some follow-up discussions with teachers, making suggestions for way to um, improve things that we're doing for our um, English learners. And uh, we also, with that $10,000 grant, did some after-school tutoring. Um, we started last year the EL pack for parents. One of the things that we really felt was important in our turnaround plan was to engage the community and engage our parents in the process and in um, what's happening here at JFK for their students. And um, something else that I really feel was instrumental in our turnaround um, was that we increased the, the staffing here at JFK. Um, we now have uh, two full-time ESL teachers in the building. Um, and that's allowing us to provide more inclusionary support so students have more support um, in all of their content areas as well as some direct language instruction or language acquisition instruction. So you can see in the documents that we passed along to you um, <coughs> some of the data um, around um, our um, status in 2018, the points we were awarded, um, our um, target percentage was quite low and in 2019, um, we earned many points for achievement, uh, growth, and um, attendance, and uh, so we, we made <coughs> remarkable improvements just in one year. This is a five-year turnaround plan. Um, also, the document um, that detailed data that you have shows that we exceeded our targets um, in many areas and that we did um, show growth for our EL and former EL students uh, in 2019. Um, we have lots to do, and this is really the beginning of it, but um, I'm pleased to share that information. Dave's going to talk a little bit about our uh, turnaround plan and grant for 2019. Yeah, so as you're looking at the, the table that you see, the targeted assistance grant uh, summary of activities, really it's helpful for context. It's helpful to think of this process as two phase. Last year was an implementation grant, so interestingly they gave us, you know, $10,000, uh, while we were writing a grant about what we're going to do. So as Leslie uh, described, one of the things that we were focused on was building capacity with professional development while also supporting students directly. When we're thinking about uh, English learners, the two things uh, for you folks to be thinking about are both direct English language instruction, right, that's provided by uh, essentially here Lauren Barry and Michelle Emanation, but English language educators specifically for language acquisition, right, developing skills and speaking uh, listening, reading, and writing, but then also the sort of sheltered English immersion work that's done in all of the general ed classrooms, right? The reason I urge you to think about it in those two pieces is because all of the work that we're doing is trying to build capacity in those two areas. So last year the work that was done uh, was to try to build everybody's capacity, teachers, ESPs, across the building um, to ensure that environments were uh, more ripe for English language learning. When we think about the metrics that are important, again, the uh, information you have in front of you really focuses on MCAS results, and that is very important. And the other metric we think about when we're talking about our English learners is their development of um, English language, right, which is not really reflected in these documents. So then, fast forward to this year. As Leslie said, we got the plan approved, and then they awarded us $20,000 to implement this year, this being essentially year one of, you know, of the phase of improvement. So if you look at the summary of the activities, you can see it, but really it, uh, our thinking was that we wanted to grade these funds with existing district priorities. So really we're talking about curriculum development. That comes in the form of professional development. Uh, the superintendent you know, encouraged us to look into leveraging local uh, University of Ohio Learning and bringing in experts on curriculum development to support the stipended work of actually developing a curriculum. That curriculum development work takes two, uh, two main paths. One is creating an actual English language curriculum that ensures that we have units of study for English learners at each level of language proficiency, newcomers with no English, to those students who are able to engage with English, uh, certainly learning activities and curriculum, 
at a high level, but also across grade levels, specifically here at six through eight. But then also think of the general curriculum units. You may be aware, certainly those uh, members who are returning are aware of the significant work that Dr. Fevers <coughs> and the district have been doing in terms of our cur you know, curriculum writ large. The other aspect, in addition to the specific English language curriculum, is ensuring that those curriculum units have considerations and components in them to support the learning of English learners um, from a content perspective. So that's one aspect of the work. Another aspect of the work is just instructional materials, right? Ensuring that we can never have enough materials that are uh, essentially uh, support literacy, right? So high interest uh, materials that are consistent with the topics that are being covered in some of our classrooms that are approachable or accessible to our English learners. That's, uh, there's some money in there for that. There's uh, a little bit of money in there. Again, uh, Leslie mentioned Albert Moussad with CES. We've engaged with him over the last several years. He's been very helpful. He was working with us last year. There's some money to uh, ensure he can continue that. You'll also see a significant amount of money in stipends just to allow us access to staff. So we wanted to ensure we had the ability to pay staff for the time, you know, to engage them in some of this work. Um, so really, it's consistent with both local funds that are being uh, deployed in these ways, but also some of our Title III monies that we get uh, to do some of that. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited. As Leslie said, even as we were doing this work, as we were writing the plan, we were engaging concurrently in those activities. That resulted in some, uh, some pr really encouraging results. And I'm really excited about the work that we're able to do here, continuing some of the tutoring, expanding that, so that not only will kids uh, benefit over the course of this year, between now and the end of the year, but we're really cultivating a, a situation here where folks will be able to uh, perform into the future. Uh, so it's really uh, exciting, um, and I urge you to sort of review that table for those activities. And uh, please don't hesitate either now or in the future to ask questions, you know, about them if you're interested. Um, I think one of the things that um, I'd like to highlight is the time that our um, uh, ESL teachers are spending with our general ed teachers, collaborating, um, co-planning, and co-teaching lessons. Um, I think it's had a significant impact. Um, so some of the stipends would be going um, to that kind of work. And um, we have a school-wide student <coughs> here, um, which really speaks to the commitment of our faculty um, around making these improvements and helping um, our English learners and our former English learners. And so we have a shared student learning goal, which focuses on uh, language acquisition and language objectives. And um, we're really looking at uh, doing uh, more progress monitoring and um, collecting data around how our students are um, uh, acquiring their uh, language. So. And that progress monitoring piece has really been one of the core focuses of the uh, department support, you know, in the form of the statewide system of support. They've been helpful because, again, there are a lot of structures already in place here at JFK to do that work, just helping us think through how to most cohesively put that together for this uh, purpose. Thank you. Are there any um, questions from school committee members about the about the grant and the work you'll be doing, Mr. Cobb? Thank you. Uh, no question, but just thank you so much for your presentation and um, congratulations not only on the grant but these. Um, you, I know you shared a little bit about this on the school improvement plan, but it's good to focus it on this one population, and it makes so much sense all the work that you've been doing, and certainly I really appreciate the planning that that went into this, not only for the two of you, but I'm sure the whole JFK community. So. Um, thank you. Keep this coming. <laughs> um. Sorry. I couldn't see whose hand went up first, so. Um, thank you for what you're doing and, and for your report, and I really appreciate seeing the amount of collaboration that it looks like you're focusing on. Um, I have a, a couple of questions just about um, the, the degree to which when you're doing um, curriculum enhancement you're really focusing on culturally responsive pedagogy and curriculum and also what kind of work you're doing to look at and when you say collecting data to collect data about the student experience um, specifically looking at as you're doing professional development looking at bias work or anti-bias work with teachers as well as um, thinking about student engagement as a as a piece of the work that you're doing as a building, we've done some anti-bias work in the past, and we continue to kind of have that lens around um, uh, 
our curriculum, uh, a lot of the curriculum that has been developed um, in our uh, all of our core content areas is, is really working on becoming more culturally proficient and providing more um, access to students um, to relevant uh, resources and materials. Um, to speak to, I'm trying to think the the, the second. Sorry, the so the anti-bias piece is really important. What was the the other part of your question? Um, wondering if, as you're collecting data, whether you're also looking at the student engagement piece and and the student experience as well. We are, and I think that speaks to some of the improvements that we made in um, our absenteeism. Um, last year, we put together. Um, small circles of support for students um, to connect with teachers and um, we ran after school activities which were not only tutoring but they were um, opportunities for students to engage with teachers and each other um, you know around being more connected not only to the curriculum but to our community I think that's really important and so we've been really focusing on that that's been a, a real um, part of our conversations. How do we do the work around academics, but also the work around connecting our students, uh, this particular group of students and their families um, in the community and in our school. So, yeah. And certainly from my perspective, that's what allowed us to improve the attendance rates. Essentially, if you think about the supports that were put in place and some of the decisions that Leslie made uh, in supporting staff here, we were able to bookend the school day, uh, leveraging the forum that's in place several times a week here, creating forum experiences for uh, a significant number of the students in this subgroup uh, with staff that uh, really were uh, targeted in terms of the rapport and that relationship and that carried over not only during those forum activities but then at the end of the school day the tutoring uh, programming wasn't purely academic in nature it also was to try and create positive experiences for students within the building so that there was more than just the you know reading writing arithmetic experience uh, for them which is you know, again not always uh, not always the a way to engage them so that I think is really what allowed us to to make the gains you'll see in the attendance rates. Ms. Voss. Um, so yeah, thank you. And I was I was going to comment on the improved attendance rate and ask you why that might have happened. So you, in the sense you answered my question, but maybe I'll just expand and say it's greatly improved, but still has a little ways to go. And I'm wondering what you're thinking in terms of um, where that's headed. Yeah, so one of the things we tried to do um, is we've drastically increased the potential for tutoring opportunities. And, you know, in other parts of the district and here, uh, historically, there's been some community outreach, so tutoring off-site, so not just after-school programming, but going out. One of the things that we're in preliminary discussions here is expanding that beyond just our English language educators. Uh, I mean, you know, we're in the early stages of discussions with some of the groups like the math department, for example, and I'm really looking forward to being able to have opportunities to expand on that in the hopes that building those experiences uh, will help students feel more positive about the school experience, which can be expected to you know, indirectly cause uh, increased attendance. Um, would be one of the, the primary uh, vectors at this point. Yeah, and I think a lot of the things that we're doing within the building around um, forum, making connections for s students, and also having teachers in their general ed classes who are now helping them be more successful, I really feel like we're, and also providing um, support for teachers in those classes as well around um, you know, kind of modifying what needs to be done. So I, I really feel it's a lot of things. We're also really trying to engage families in, in um, making sure kids are getting to school. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really hopeful, and it's not just this population, but again, being able to increase our opportunity to do some outreach. You know, again, we were, for a long time we've had a district outreach social worker, adding a, an additional uh, position of that uh, sort. You know, again, not directly for this population, but I think that will help us as well, just increasing the boots on the ground, you know, our ability to reach families in that way. Mr. Gold. Um, I just want to share uh, first congrats I mean moving from that nine percentile to 67 is fantastic I mean do, our school does a lot of work around that so to make that jump and I think it's a big credit to how you guys it seems like you address both achievement growth and the additional indicators which that, that leveled one um, what I'm wondering and I appreciate in looking at your plan was so much of it is around professional development and capacity 
Is there anything that you're look, in looking forward that when, if, if and when the grant money runs out that you're not going to be able to continue to provide? I mean, a lot of it seems like it's capacity building, so there isn't, but I saw there's like, like 4,000 or so for our tutoring after school, you know, those kind of things require the funds. So I'm just wondering on that piece, like looking forward to maintain this so it doesn't, you know, not, not fall back, whatever, you know what I mean, like able to keep, keep up where you're at. Yeah, and that was very important to us, that it wasn't transitory, right? It wasn't uh, ephemeral in nature, right? This idea that the money was being spent in a lasting way. So again, we're talking about materials, we're talking about building capacity, but the tutoring specifically is an additional infusion. The hope is that it can you know, show an immediate effect. But when I talk about braiding funds, we have local funds that we deploy annually, and we made it. We have made a commitment to using our Title III funds, which are funds specifically for this population, that also uh, do that. So we are fortunate that we get uh, additional infusion, but those activities won't peter out. They will. They are just enhanced this year in a way that. Um, they aren't in other years, if that makes sense. And um, part of our school improvement plan does focus on this as well, um, around how we can um, support um, our English learners in accessing um, things after <coughs> school, both here and in the community. And we're really working on that too as a school council. So we've taken this on. Um, that's a, a, it's a great question, and I'm hoping that the tutoring can continue. We will find a way to have that continue. And just to give you a concrete example, when we think about you know what that capacity building looks like, in addition to the actual curriculum units themselves, Leslie talked a little about the, the with the increased staffing, we've been able to put English language educators in general ed, other general ed classrooms more often, but creating structures and sort of collaborative experiences and ways of being in terms of shifting practice slightly. So that's one of the lasting effects that is really encouraging over time. So uh, that is uh, one of the things we think about that will remain after the funds, you know, to do the PD run out. I just wanted to follow up on a piece of this is that because um, it's a subgroup, it could be any subgroup a different year. And so this plan is applicable in many ways to whatever another year at a different school or the high school level. So to really, you know, leverage this experience for other subgroups in the future for data, like remember what you guys did because that's, that's spectacular. Congrats. Yeah. Ms. Brusansky. I'm just, uh, congratulations on the grant and uh, the explanation of the plans. It's been really helpful. I'm just kind of curious. I'm trying to get a sense of, so does this get dispersed equally between grades? Is there, is the population must be different in each year? Or how does it look? So our population here is pretty equally distributed across the three mm -hmm. grades. So you're talking about of the 21 active English learners. You know, really, I mean, you have more sixth graders, uh, and the eighth grade is the, the second largest, but they're pretty evenly distributed, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, each grade level. Yeah. But yes, so the idea is the improvements that are made both in materials and in PD have uh, equitable sort of distribution in that way. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as though we're focusing on, you know, one grade level or one team in that way even though some of the strategies and things that have those impacts. Mm -hmm. You know, like we talked about focusing on specific teams across, but it's evenly distributed across the three. And the, and the students require different services, and so that's really fluid. We're really, you know, as new students come in and as, you know, um, students then move on, uh, we're really looking at how we can best deploy all of our resources to make sure that everybody's getting the support they need. Um, and um, we also, for, for the students um, in order to make sure they do get that support each we do have one seventh grade team one sixth grade team and one eighth grade team that really shelters the um, students as much as we can so then we can uh, use our teachers um, in those classes so it's really about scheduling and about kind of identifying the needs and figuring out a way to do that in terms of targeting though one of the things that we are able to do to speak to the earlier question about uh, what we do with the in this infusion is most years we're not really in a position to look at individual uh, tutoring to a significant degree. We focus on small group just in terms of uh, uh, efficacy and efficiency, but this year we're much more able with the, this infusion to target specific students and look at individual tutoring in a real way, mm -hmm. which is a, a great position to be in. Yeah, and we're gonna be using progress monitoring to identify students in the areas that they need more support. Yes, thanks. Okay. Any other uh, comments or? Thank you very much for the presentation and Thank congratulations you. again. Okay, um, we now have a series of votes, uh, two regarding donations. Um, 
first is uh, from the NHS PTO in the amount of $1,440. And then um, the second is from the Leeds PTO, $1,495. Um, I will ask. Uh, Motion to accept the NHS PTO donation. Okay. Is there a second? Second. second. Ms. Lamica, did you want to uh, give us some background on that? Sure. The high school uh, PTO donation is to support the students and travel costs for the Washington, D.C. spring band trip. Um, and the Leeds PTO is part of the PTO's that is part of the Gibbs program that was previously approved by the school committee. So, um, so the motion is on the PTO, NHS PTO gift for 1440 Is there any questions about that? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Um, if someone will make a follow-up motion on the next one, the Leeds PTO gift. Motion to accept the, NH, uh, the Leeds PTO donation. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay. Any questions about that one? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so those two gifts are gratefully approved. Um, next, we have a vote to approve a 7D van driver job description. And um, I will uh, ask Ms. Lamica to explain that one for us. Sure. Uh, this is a job description that we've also discussed uh, with NACE, and that's why it had a draft version. Sent out to the committee. Um, they've reviewed it as well and are approving um, the format that we have it in. Um, we run a fleet of our own uh, 20 passenger wheelchair buses uh, this year because we've had such difficulty obtaining bus drivers that have CDL licenses to drive the bus drive uh, buses. We've actually looked at purchasing two vans, which would be 7D vans, so it'd be a different driver licensing requirement. A 7D license is much easier to obtain than a CDL license, so we're hoping that the employment of CD, uh, 7D drivers will be easier to obtain. And also at the same time, we put in a capital request for this coming year, instead of replacing one of our buses, to be actually be buying two vans. One will be a wheelchair van, one will be a regular eight passenger van, and that way we can also facilitate um, transporting some of our McKinney Bento students. Um, and some foster care students much easily um, time-wise than we can by getting a contracted service that we have to schedule if we can obtain the services. Um, so we're asking for approval of that job description so we can post it and get that underway. Is there a motion to approve that job description? <coughs> motion to approve the van driver job description. Is there a second? Second. Second. <coughs> a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Yes. Um, this is uh, in terms of best practice for all job descriptions within the district. Um, and please tell me if this is not the level of detail you want to have discussion about. Um, but in general, um, it would be just moving forward, it would be really important to see some enhancements to the language of all job descriptions that include some kind of language for diversity and inclusion both in the, um, the essential functions as well as in the recommended minimum qualifications. And that will then aid the, the, uh, the hiring process. Uh, and this would be something that I would hope would become standard practice for all job descriptions regardless of the position within the district. Okay. Um, so do you have, is there a specific changes you want to make tonight or you just want to put that out there so that we could work on that as a universal issue? Uh, I'm happy to do either. Um, I can give you some really quick, uh, just off the top of my head, um, additions that could be made. Um, but I also do want to put it out there as something to be worked on in the future. Okay. Um, are there other ways that we can enhance it easily tonight? With yeah, so I would say in the essential functions, um, you know, we have supervises students on school van, maintains order as necessary, um, transports students to and from various schools. So there, would be, you could either enhance those to say supervises students from a variety of backgrounds, or you could add a bullet that says um, 
supports or effectively supports and interacts with students from a diverse set of perspectives or diverse backgrounds. And then for the recommended minimum qualifications, I would add a bullet uh, under knowledgeability and skill that says um, ability to effectively support and interact with diverse students, families, and educators, or something along that lines. Okay. So would you, um, would you maybe modify the one that says ability to interact mm -hmm. well with children of yeah. all ages? Can I ask yeah. a question? Yes. It appears as though you're reading from notes. Would it be possible for you to share those with us so that we can make sure we get those into the job? Oh, description? I'm not reading from notes. I'm oh. just making okay. it up as I look at okay. the, but I'm happy to send, I'm happy to okay. send you something in writing. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so did you get those additions, Annie, when she yeah. read them? Okay. So would you make those in the form of a, just a motion to amend those or just, or just say I'd like to move those as amendments? Description. And move those as amendments yes. to the job description. Yes. She's got them already written down. Is there a second on those? A second. Okay. And, and I think we even have a history of approving a job description with um, the superintendent taking in yeah. the flavor of what was recommended. <laughs> to his Dr. Plummer. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'd like to that. Okay. Okay. Um, um, except that I now have a motion made and seconded to make that suggestion or amendment so would you are you saying we should to, do that or no I'm saying we should I'm proposing we approve the job description and allow the superintendent to make adjustments in the spirit of what was just proposed okay are you comfortable with that yep. okay excellent so then I'll just call the I'll just call the final question then all those in favor <laughs> of approving the job description as discussed um, please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed any abstentions Okay. Um, next is a report from uh, uh, the business administrator about the fiscal 2020 McKinney Vento appropriation. So I just wanted to let the school committee know that the mayor recommended and put forward a supplemental budget amount in the amount of $19,298 to our fiscal 2020 school department budget uh, for McKinney Vento homeless transportation. Uh, the City Council approved it on December 19th, so that amount will now be included and added to our fiscal 20 budget for that purpose. Just by the way, the, the way, just for people's explanation, just the way that those monies flow to us after the budget year has started, they end up coming to us as part of the city's free cash. Um, and so we, my practice has been to then just appropriate it back to the school committee. So, and we do that with other departments that have grants. So that's the reason for the, we don't typically do a supplemental budget, but that's just one of the unique ones that happens. Right, um, that's, that's one of those undetermined amounts of reimbursement you don't know until you get until July after the year ends. Exactly. So, okay, the next is a report on teacher response to late start time. And I believe Heather Brown is with us tonight from NACE to uh, give us a report. Hi. I'm Heather Brown, Vice President of NACE, and I'd like to welcome our new members and um, congratulate you. And also thank our uh, former members and everybody here for your dedication, energy, and commitment to our public schools. Um, I have some data here that I just printed out today, so I'll just Um, and I can repeat or send you parts of this if you need it. So NACE uh, surveyed our members over the last couple of weeks and uh, we did an electronic survey and the data is coming around so I'll give you a second to get a packet and look at it. It's pretty short. So based on the proposal to this, uh, changing the start times just by a half hour for each school level, uh, we devised a set of questions and pulled our members and we did get um, kind of a low response. So that was something that I'd like you to you know note with some caution on the data. But we pulled our uh, body which is made up of more than 500 members and we got 207 responses as of yesterday at five o'clock so that's 40 percent of our members who responded 
and there's a chart, um, a graph here that says uh, out of those people who responded, where they work. So 51.2% uh, of the respondents were from elementary schools, 23% uh, were from JFK, 22% from the high school, and 34 work in, uh, throughout the district at multiple school levels. And um, of those respondents, we separated them also by unit. So you can see a list of the units uh, on the right. So unit A, teachers member, 85% of the respondents were in the teachers unit. Um, unit B, our administrators, is a small unit anyway, but um, 2.4 of the respondents were in that unit. And unit C is our uh, ESPs. And they were, they made up 10% of the respondents. Unit G is cafeteria and unit F is custodial. And they made up 1.5%. Uh, and then unit E is our clerical unit, which 2.4% of respondents were from those groups. And then um, on page two, it talks about what they said. So we tried to give general responses to the questions, and the questions are stated here. And then we also broke down the questions and the responses by um, which buildings responded in which ways and what units uh, said different things. So on page two, we have um, the questions that gave a range. How do the proposed start times work for you? The um, number system we used was one, would be uh, opposed to the change or that the change would be terrible and I would need to find another job. So that was like, they really didn't like the change. And so if you look at that number, uh, uh, overall out of the 207 responses, 9.7% of them said it would be terrible. Um, the second response was 28.5% uh, of people just said it, maybe it wouldn't be terrible, but they were still opposed to it in some way. 31.4% um, said it, would, it was neutral. They had no opinion one way or the other. 8.7% um, were in favor, and five, uh, number five rating uh, would, would love it or strongly in favor. We had 21.7% of our members uh, say that. If you go to page three, the responses are broken down by um, schools or levels. So um, you can look at that page for a second. And our, our smallest population here was the were the people who work in multiple buildings. So we only have we only have seven. We have a small number of people who do that, but seven of them responded. And. Um, most of those people looks like they were either uh, opposed to the idea or f pretty neutral about the idea of changing the start times. Um, we didn't ask for uh, reasons uh, d directly about that, but there are some reasons on the back that you'll see after we finish this. Um, so for elementary schools, we got a strong response. It looks like 106 people who work in elementary schools responded, and that, that made up almost half of the uh, elementary employees. And of those, you can see that 13% um, 13 are strongly opposed to the change, 37 are opposed to the change, so if you add those two together, you get uh, about 50, 51% uh, are opposed to the change at the elementary level, and 30% of elementary employees were neutral about it, um, and there were 17% who were in favor. Uh, at the middle school level, we got 48 responses. 10% of those were strongly opposed, and 17 were opposed. So we totaled those up, and overall it looked like 27% of the people were opposed. 27% um, were neutral, and 37% were in favor, if you add the strong support with the support. So that one looks like divided into thirds. And at the high school, we received 46 responses, which is um, less than half of the employees who work at the high school. And we see 22% uh, of those people are opposed, either strongly or somewhat. 
30% again neutral and 43% of high school employees were in support of the start time change. And then on the back page, we have a question where we asked um, if there are conflicts that you might imagine that will arise from this change. 50% 50 50 of the uh, respondents said the proposed change would not cause conflicts with other commitments. And then the other 50% listed conflicts with jobs, child and family commitments, child care arrangements, and appointments. Uh, we didn't break this one out by level because the responses were similar uh, in all the areas. So it was split pretty evenly between people who said this won't cause a, a problem for <coughs> me or my um, family or my students at all, and um, the other half said it would. And so we also had an open-ended um, comment section, and we synthesized the most popular and common comments that we received here. <coughs> so um, mostly we heard that elementary um, start time at, of 920 seemed like it was too late, and people suggested, and this was interesting to me, it didn't look like that came from only elementary school teachers. Uh, people said, based on data that they've read, they thought, that that was kind of a late time for younger students to start school um, for their families. And some of them cited their own uh, personal uh, jobs and, and conflicts there. But they said elementary students do their best learning earlier in the day and are frequently tired at the end of the day. Um, that was our biggest recurring concern. Transportation was a concern that came up often in the responses. They said. Uh, buses are already picking up students on the late side this year and um, at last year as well. And it seems like that would really um, extend the younger kids' day even longer if the buses are running late and they're getting out a half hour later. Um, feedback that elementary schools should start before high schools as uh, much of the research suggests. Discussion of research around later start times for older students, that was mostly in support of the change, saying that it seemed consistent. Um, concern about sports and after school activities for students who participate and employees who are parents of children who participate. Um, but I also talked to some athletic um, participants uh, who work at the school and they, they suggested that they could move schedules if that were the case. Uh, and before and after school programs were a concern and a question. Will they uh, adjust their service hours to accommodate us? You know, how are we going to go about figuring that out? So that was a question we had often. And um, people also wanted to look at having mandatory employee meetings, uh, perhaps during early release days or other times, so that they weren't meeting uh, late into the evening if school was extended by that half hour. So, so that's the, the basic gist of what we found. And I'll give you a minute to look over what you have there or ask questions if you have any. Yes. Uh, first off, thanks for collecting this data. Um, uh, my, my question uh, goes to the first graph about uh, the number of respondents, and maybe you can speak to this, or maybe Dr. Provost can. 51% uh, of the responses came from elementary. Does that? roughly match up to the percentage of NACE employees, are roughly half of the NACE employees employed in the elementary school? Or were they were they more likely to respond than the other levels? Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, um, let's see. I, I would guess that we have more elementary employees than Midland. Well, there's no, definitely the high school is on the low end in terms of employees. Um, it's hard for me to, to distinguish between elementary and middle. I think they're pretty comparable. Um, but elementary does have a lot of um, more paraprofessionals. It has a kindergarten paraprofessionals, um, preschool paraprofessionals. So I guess looking at that, can you tell in this graph how many of those are pairs? Well, I guess that's the next one, right? Mm -hmm. So unit C is a small slice of that pie. So it looks like most of the respondents were unit A. So I guess I would say that based on my knowledge of staffing patterns, I couldn't make any kind of a guess about whether these are more heavily weighted towards elementary, middle, or high. Okay. It, does, it does suggest here that uh, a lot of the high school um, respondents said they were neutral. So uh, 
you know, they're responding, but they're saying I, I'm flexible about it or they had a higher rate of support for it. And I, I don't know if maybe the elementary responded, you know, with a higher percentage because they wanted to voice some concerns about or it. Or they had stronger feelings about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yes, I, Dr. I, if you don't mind my sharing your little <coughs> qualitative study you did. Mm -hmm. um, Heather was sharing with me that she spent time going around to people who she knew didn't respond and asking, so <laughs> why aren't you responding? What do you think? And spend? I work in high school, so right. that was where I did that. And um, most of the people said they didn't respond because they didn't care. So, you know, you might think they're neutral. Right. Yeah, they said it, it's either way, I, I'd be okay with it. So I just, that was just uh, an aside and it was a handful of people that I contacted that I knew uh, hadn't responded. So these, uh, the feedback we also got was anonymous. We, we could see uh, an email of, of who did respond, but we don't know what they said. Um, so that was, yeah, an aside from high school. So I think, you know, uh, and also there's a history of uh, having had these studies in the past. It depends on people who were engaged in the past in the discussions on Late Start, and uh, maybe some of the newer folks wanted to weigh in, and the people who've weighed in again and again, maybe they said, oh, I'm hang back this time. I don't, I don't really know. There's a good mix of, of new feelings about this and some people who've already engaged in it for many years and are kind of saying, all right, I'll just let it play out for now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you could see from all of this that the elementary school um, employees had the strongest feelings against it, and they had also the most questions about it. Yeah. Anything else? Just for clarity, so the question of uh, we asked we asked about a pen potential conflicts if the change were implemented. That was asked of everybody. Mm -hmm. So 50% said it would not cause a conflict or potentially those that like the idea. Right? Say that again. Is, you, is, you start off by saying 50% said the change would not cause any conflicts with other commitments. There's a decent chance that that might be the people that also simultaneously like the idea. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure that was asked of everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how long you've been around, but do you recall, was something similar, similar to this asked of teachers in the past that you're aware of? Let's see. I, I was here for that last discussion of the, of the possibility of changing the start times. And uh, I don't remember NACE conducting this kind of a survey, but I know we had public forums and discussions that were more open. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, it's not really, it's just from your opinion. Now, is it, do you have a sense on where teachers are um, now, maybe compared to where they were? And I, and I realize that's just your own opinion and insights as to that, but I'm just, I guess I'm wondering whether anything has changed. And due to what the Dr. Provo said, that maybe we're, well, I yeah, yeah. I, actually, I, can say I actually can maybe just say something about that that might that might give some insight. So the last time this was done, there had been some uh, <coughs> research done at the high school. This was prior coming to my my coming to the district, but it was shared with me that a start time of eight o'clock would be acceptable to the high school. I mean. If, the evidence-based start time should be 8.30, yeah. but once you get beyond 8 o'clock, it gets a little bit tricky with sports and other things after school. Um, so I was taking that, not really knowing how it was conducted or whatever, but just taking that as sort of an article of faith. The rest of the faculty <coughs> was not surveyed last time because the last time we tried to put together a plan, the question was, could we create a later start time at the high school without changing the start time for any of the other schools? So there, there would have no impact on the other employees or the other families. Right. Uh, that's one of the things I was going to say. We looked at various models last time. Yeah. And um, so it was mostly a discussion around the high school. And this time, because it's, it's suggesting an elementary change, it seems right. like a lot of elementary uh, families and uh, employees are concerned about that yeah. based on the same kind of research and data and also the transportation issues which were the issues last time uh, for the high school. Good point, thanks. I, and just real quick, I just want to point out on page three, none, none of these percentages add up to 100%, so. Uh, there, there were, um, you know, like sometimes if we rounded up if it was a 0.8, 
so I don't know. No, it's not that. I, no. I think it's far greater than that. So there might Let's be see. just people who didn't respond that you're counting in here is my guess. But you um, probably, if you're going to make this Oh, it would be <coughs> if they skipped the question. Probably, what? If they skipped a question, yes. we yeah we didn't account for those. Right, so you pro you might just want to say X percent did not respond. Yeah. Just because if you're going to hone in on these, it's it's clear to the reader. But thank That's you for right. doing this. It's very helpful. Okay, sure. Um, and also, um, let's see, one more thing I would add. Uh, I think Dr. Provost just mentioned it is that some people did comment on that the research said that this eight o'clock isn't going to be as significant for high school because the recommended change would be uh, 8.15 or 8.30. Mm -hmm. um, we did get a few feedback um, comments about that, but there were only a handful, so we didn't include those. Um, and we did kind of talk about in our executive board <coughs> and when we were uh, discussing the results here just yesterday that um, since the elementary responses are largely opposed, that, that we might kind of think about other proposals for that or consider other ideas. Um, for the elementary school or, or think about it in a broader way. So that's what came up when we, when we finish with this data for us. Anything else? In the discussion about the, um, about the elementary starting before high school, was that like they should be flip-flopped or, I mean, was it that, how, how much was that discussion? People mentioned that yeah. in, in the comments, but you know, that's a bigger discussion, I yeah. think, that we all need to have. I can speak to that. Um, in the communication to the school committee, I said I think this is plan number six or <coughs> seven. Um, Flip-flopping the tiers was one of the early plans that was rejected by the school committee. It is the one that is the most consistent with the research. Um, elementary kids actually do better when they start earlier, and high, older kids do better when they start later, so swapping that would seem like it's the logical thing to do. It's also cost neutral, just as this plan is. However, last time the reason the school committee rejected it, from my understanding, again, was before my time, was because concerns were raised about the need for older kids to be home to provide daycare for younger kids. Okay. since that time our um, after school and before school programs have been expanded so it might be something to consider again looking at the the programs that we have and and that was one of the questions that people often brought up <coughs> about how would those programs work according to this new schedule and maybe they could work in the, in beneficial ways if we reconsidered the elementary time changing and not not changing it to so so it sounds like a conversation maybe that we need to have more of. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes. Ms. Voss? Sorry, Ms. Brown, may I ask? Oh, sorry, question. <laughs> um, from the perspective, you're representing me, so I, don't, I know it's hard because maybe you haven't asked this question, but one concern I have, I, I feel like the school committee has talked about so many different things and there's so many costs associated with them and I really want to find a solution for the high school kids. Um, when I campaigned last time, when I campaigned this time, this was something when you knock on doors you hear about this. Um, it's one of the most common topics and there's kids out far away from high school who are getting out for the bus before 6.30 in the morning and, um, and it, it's just not working. We saw data from the high school student union of how many hours of sleep the students are getting. So as we think about this, um, I don't want to spend another year talking about it. I want to actually try something and try to solve it. So I guess a question I have is, what point in the calendar do teachers need to know there's going to be a change to be fair to them? So for example, last year, this came before us in May, and it really felt like you can't change the start time on teachers who might be setting up their daycare arrangements, et cetera, for the next year in May. And we're already at January. But where, can you give us some guidance in what you think would feel reasonable? And again, I know I'm totally putting on the spot because you're one person of a whole group, but you're here. <laughs> well, it is. it does constitute a change in our working conditions. So it seems that it's a, it's a bargaining issue. Uh, 
I, we, we talked about that, but I don't, we haven't talked about any date by which we would want to see something. Um, we do have our annual, our general uh, membership meeting in April every year. By our bylaws, we have it um, the week follow the the week we return from April break. So that might be something to think about. But we, I would have to ask more questions, or we would have to have more conversations about that. Any other questions for? Ms. Brown. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you to Nace for compiling this research for us. So we do have a we do have on the agenda a discussion um, about <coughs> a possible vote on late start time. And um, Dr. Provost, what your what your reactions are, or what your recommendation is for us, how how you think we should proceed on this? Well. Now have all of the data that you asked to be collected. So I, th I think there should just be a discussion and decision about whether or not to implement this plan. Um, to summarize, the teachers' uh, data is mixed. I would add, and I'll ask Heather if you can just nod if you agree. It seems like <coughs> the high school teachers are more strongly in favor of the change, and the elementary teachers are more strongly opposed. Um, so I think they're in the middle. School teachers are somewhere in the middle. Um, so I, I think you have uh, inconclusive data from teachers. The high school students, I think, are in favor. That's the second group, and Eleanor's nodding in approval. Um, and the data that we collected from parents showed that the parents, and we, we started with the elementary because, and this is a shock to me because I felt that elementary parents were likely to find this to be really unacceptable, um, but they initially supported it by two to one um, in the responses that we got collected through the school councils. Um, you sent me out on a mission to try to find the third that are opposed and find out more about reasons why, which I did at the open houses, and in discussions with parents found that they were even more supportive. So, you know, you, you, the data shows you have students who want to do this, parents who want to do this, and the teachers are, are split based on where they work. So you can only decide that through your deliberation. Okay. Mr. Kaufman? Um, I do want to ask Dr. Provost, and feel free to take a pass if you don't want to talk first, but if, if there's, I, I'm quite confident, let me know if you disagree, that the, the research and what you have expressed in the past, that this change for middle school and high school students um, from a scientific basis of, of when their brains are going to be most likely to take in information and benefit from this change would be a positive? There's no question about that. Yeah. So then my concern then is what do we know, what do you know about elementary school students in terms of pushing their time back and how do you feel about that? Does that negate this for you or do you still feel, uh, can you make a judgment and share your opinion on whether it's, it's worthwhile to pursue? So I, I can't really speak to the impact of going later in the day for elementary students. I am familiar with research that strongly suggests that going earlier in the day for elementary students would be better. Um, so um, as I said, I think the best plan was the one that was rejected long ago, but one of the um, directives that I got from the school committee is don't bring us any plans that we've already rejected in the past because we'll just reject them again. So um, I think this is probably the, the best, most viable plan that exists at this time. Yeah, but the, the, I think the concern that was raised by Heather and I've heard also is not that, the, it's, the, it's not the late start time for elementary school students, it's the late afternoon time. Um, where particularly the younger students might just be st struggling to stay aware and alert as the later it gets. Is that something you've heard? And well, I, I'm not, I, I can't answer it from, around. I can't answer it from the um, perspective of research. Okay. I can say it's consistent with my knowledge of young, young learners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when you said it's better to start early. Um, yes, there is research. School, is that there is research. Start or the it, end or both? Yes. No, which one? Is it because they starting early is good for them? Because they're more available for learning earlier in the day. So the, the earlier you can get them into instruction, yeah. the better for them. And how about the later of, of ending in, within those same reports that they touch upon that? No, I mean, in, in the research I'm familiar with, they start earlier and they end earlier. They're keeping the amount of instruction roughly equal to what, you know, it is 
currently. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Provost, you mentioned that uh, a previous school committee said don't bring anything back that we've vetoed, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, of those members, how many are sitting now at this, these tables? So is it the same committee, or is this a new committee that would be entertaining that rejected proposal? Well, it's, it's five new members, as you know. So um, I, I can't answer that because I haven't received any direction from the new committee on that. I, all I can say is, as Dr. Voss said, this is a process that we started last spring, and so we're following through with the initial direction that was, was given at that time. I'll, I'll add to this conversation. Um, I, I understand his directive. I didn't buy into it two years ago, and I personally did explore some other models. I felt like that was important. and. Dr. Provost knows this because he and I have met a number of times about it. Um, we met with a group from UMass in their transportation engineering, and unfortunately, for reasons I don't understand, we've kind of just lost, they haven't responded in the last year. Um, but we explored some ideas there, and then more recently we've explored some other ideas. And um, I, I guess I disagree that it's that straightforward to just swap elementary and high school. Um, if you swap them, then you do need to start talking about the sports because high school will probably start after 8.30. And I'm not judging that, I'm just saying that adds another dimension that has to be part of the conversation at that point. So I don't think it's just a swap at that point. What was proposed many years ago was a lot more complicated than what a member of the school committee this last January proposed, Ms. Hennessy. The proposal she made was let's just delay each school by half an hour because we know the busing works that way and it's a very simple thing to, to implement. But when you start flipping things around, there's all sorts of complications in making sure that everything works out. So that's what she proposed and we, we had started talking about. Um, I've done quite a bit of thinking about how, do you, how could you get the elementary school home sooner. And the really big problem is our elementary schools are six hours and our middle school and our high school are six and a half hours. And, if, and, and when you start playing with these busing schedules, that is the limiting factor unless you want to spend more money on busing or put kids on buses together, which was another big problem people had six or seven years ago. Again, a different conversation, <coughs> um, which this current proposal avoids. And whatever of these things you take up, you're going to have this kind of survey where 10% of the people are going to move away because they don't want their elementary school kids on the bus with the high school, and 10% think it's fine. So I'm not judging these things. I'm just saying I don't think they're all that straightforward. But going back to this, I mean, our elementary schools are half an hour shorter, so you have this extra time in the morning that you need to delay the elementary school in our current configuration so that you can bus the high school and the middle school home before you get back to the elementary school. And really, that I think is the fundamental problem in terms of what we're up against. I don't know. Uh, agree with the, the elementary school length of day being a, another complication that makes this harder. Um, I just, and also agree, going back to uh, the written test uh, comments from Dr. Henninger, um, you're never going to be able to please all the people, especially with this. Another piece of the, another piece of the direction that I got, at the, actually it was more of a comment from a member to the rest of the committee, is we shouldn't start this process unless we're willing to make decisions that some people are going to disagree with. I think the one thing that all late start models have have generated is um, opposition, right? So that, that's, that's true. I just do want to correct one piece of the historical record on that. It, it wasn't, um, it wasn't Ms. Hennessy who uh, proposed just backing everything up. She asked me, you know, looking if I could take another look and come up with a new, yeah. a new plan. So it was actually my opinion after struggling with this for several years, that if you take all the rest of the options off the table as unacceptable for the reasons that they were deemed unacceptable in the past, that the one thing we haven't tried yet is just moving everything back half an hour. Yes, sorry. So I find this really frustrating to come in to the conversation when, to, to Susan's point, this has been 10 years in the making 
and knowing that this conversation was coming, I've been really working to try and learn the history and do my research. It was frustrating that the history that you sent, Dr. Provost, came at 11 p.m. last night. And now here we are being asked to potentially take a vote on something that has been so long in the making with, without a whole lot of insight into that history. I think to, to Sean's point, I don't know your last name. Condon. Mr. Condon's point, um, this is a different school committee than, than has, has been asking questions in the past. So when you say, you know, I've answered all the questions, I have a list of questions that I have that would help me understand what is the best model. I want to know the impact on working families. How many students would no longer, elementary school students would no longer be able to take the morning bus because their, their parents can't wait with them anymore and, and are, need to be at work. How many students would now need before school care? What would that do to the quality and, and the type of before, before school care? What would that do to the quality of after school care? Um, where's the input from historically marginalized families? What is the data collection from parents? Who is it who responded? And I, I don't see having conversations at open houses as, as data collection. And so I think there's just so, I, I have questions about the high school schedule. What kind of creative solutions have been looked at? And I'm sure like over 10 years of conversations, there must have been a lot of creativity looked at. How do you change the passing periods? How do you, how do you play with the schedule so that you have a later start and you still get out in time for athletics? There's a lot that, of questions that I have that are just unanswered. And, and I, I'm in, I've, I've worked with adolescents for years and years and I'm in full support of later start times. But I, I, it's really hard to hear <laughs> that the only solution on the table for a later start time for the high school is also a much later start time for the elementary school. It just feels really hard to wrap my head around without more information and more data. So for me personally, if I were asked to vote on this right now, I can't vote in support. And that also feels really hard because I very much support a later start time for the high school. So I, I want to air those frustrations and, a, and I guess a hope that there's opportunity to bring those of us up to speed who haven't been a part of this conversation and, and have a better sense of the history and also then give us the opportunity to ask some questions and do a little bit more digging into potential solutions. Uh, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention, so obviously I support the later heart start time for the high school, but my biggest concern going to uh, the Summer Institute, I think it was last year, uh, was Monomoy Regional School District. The superintendent was talking about how they didn't see, what they flipped their start times and while they didn't see the gains that they expected to and the improvement at the high school, what shocked them was that in the first four months alone there was a 44% decrease in office referrals at the elementary school level by shifting their start time earlier. And when we sit here and listen to teachers talking about the behavioral issues and the struggles that our elementary school students are having, I worry that not only are we not potentially getting the benefit of moving to a start time that's earlier for them, that's aligned with their natural rhythm, <coughs> but we could potentially be causing harm by moving even later. And that's what's giving me pause right now. I, am, I don't know how to make this happen for the high school without potentially causing harm at the elementary school level. When I hear then that the teachers may not support it, that makes me even more concerned that coupling these two things is, is a big mistake right now and voting on it tonight most certainly is but I understand how important a later start time at the high school is for our community. I'm about to have two students in high school. I get it on a personal level as well um, but I just yeah I really am concerned about pushing the elementary school level later. Um, without enough data. I did try and reach the superintendent at Monomoy today to get the most recent data they had. When they first started tracking, the results were pretty surprising and they have two years of data now. Um, but they had their school committee organizational meeting tonight also and he didn't get back to me in time. I think it's, um, you know, it's really unfortunate that this vote is coming at this time with five new members, this is a discussion, and, and most of the rest of us haven't, except for, haven't even been on the school committee for 10 years, but 
well aware of the conversation that's been going on and it's put you in a really difficult position and I, and I recognize that. I think um, I look at this issue and I feel like it, we, we uh, I can never even remember this saying, but the, don't let the perfect undo the good, don't let the perfect be the enemy, enemy, of, be the the enemy of the good. And I don't see it as a permanent solution by any means, I don't think of it as even stopping the conversation. I think we have to continue to find a better solution to it, but I'm not sure that should prevent us from actually making a change that we have been working on making for the past 10 years. And um, I feel like I carry that sort of torch of the people before me who have been wor who have worked so hard on it. And I think we are a new school committee, and I think we all deserve an opportunity to ask those questions. But we're kind of bumping up against a timeline where I think we have to give, if we are to make this change, we have to let people know and give them enough advance notice. So it kind of puts us all in the, between a rock and a hard place. I don't know if there's an opportunity for more discussion. And um, if you think, you think uh, I'd like to ask the superintendent if voting on it next month would be too late. Like, where, where do you think we are in terms of um, if we were to call a vote on this? I don't think next month is too late. Um, I would say this just in terms of trying to keep things organized because I, I've heard people mention other possibilities, other things. In the past, as I look at the notes in the old meetings, most of which I weren't, weren't a part of, mm -hmm. when there were competing ideas, it just became a morass of people talking about competing ideas. I think it needs to be up or down one at a time. And that's why the directive was do this one thing, research this one thing, and then, and I, I also uh, concur with your comments about how difficult it is that this is coming at this time for new members. The only reason it was delayed was because we needed to wait for the data we got tonight. And we, we were uncomfortable trying to move forward with this without getting feedback from our employees. So that, I mean, that wouldn't have been good either, right? Mm -hmm. So that's right. that's why we're in this situation. Um, Mr. Cole. Yeah, I think a, a big constituent that this impacts is families. I, like, and I know you were talking about the surveys that parent that you did at the, the open houses and other surveys in the past. Like, what percentage of parents actually provided feedback? Is there like, are you able to like, do you know like how much feedback we actually got from them? I don't recall. Um, the I, the feedback was collected through the school councils, um, so I don't know if you might have any recollection of what you got from Bridge Street. <laughs> um, I'm ask in the audience, someone who might know. <laughs> yeah. So? Uh, yeah. Can I, ask, can I ask someone in the audience who might actually know that? You could ask. Uh, you phone a friend. You wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't recall. I, so basically, in the week before, the week that since we knew that this was on the agenda, like I asked a random sampling of parents, like, are you like, are you aware of? It took me a while to know what, in all honesty, like what was the proposed change, you know? And I, I mean, that and then coming on to it, it was a little bit embarrassing. Be like, I don't know what the actual time is. It was nine twenty or whatever where it would be for elementary, and a hundred percent of parents were not aware that that meant at 920 for parents. And I'm talking about a very small, like less than 20 sampling, but there wasn't any parent who was like, yeah, Ronnie, you didn't know that? And so I guess I'm just trying to understand, do we really feel like we have a pulse on that? Because on the elementary side, I mean, you're moving past when jobs are starting, right? Like, they're, like, like that's a big thing. Like if jobs start at nine o'clock, that's all of a sudden changing a lot for the parents. And I don't know how many are really aware of that piece of it. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, I guess I would, I would want to, to, co to be able to confidently vote now, I would love to know, would need to know like more about the research and feedback from parents. Um, and then the other piece is, it says a possible vote, so that's comfortable. Yeah, that was, it was, yeah. it was only put on there cool. as a placeholder. So, all right. um, and it was asked, we were actually asked to put it on the January gotcha. agenda. Right. Because there was just concern about letting getting too late into the spring, like what happened last year, and then we'd be past the point of no return if we wanted to make it. So that's that's why it was put on the agenda that way. And then, so if it doesn't, last part, sorry, <coughs> if it doesn't get voted on, like tonight, or if we choose, I think I would 
recommend that we come up with some way to put on, and I looked and I don't see it there, like on the, <laughs> I've looked in the past on the Northampton site, like at least a page that we could describe to people like this is what your start, the proposed start time is. So we could like at least tell parents like, if you have any questions on it, this is literally what it is. And so there's something public, publicly available for it. So I would encourage us to at least have that up there as soon as possible. Can, can I just speak in support that if the school committee wants to do additional information gathering from the public, that it needs to be something in that format. Because at this point, the central office and entire administration is completely wrapped up in budget and can't, doesn't have the capacity to do more surveying, more outreach to parents. Um, we well, just we can don't. certainly put together right. a document that describes Correct. what that is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, oh, no. Go ahead. no. Uh, I don't. I don't want to devalue uh, input from parents, but as a group, we should keep in mind that I think parental input is going to be more logistically based on how that fits into their family schedule, and we need to keep in mind that the teacher's input is going to be more based on what's best for student learning. So I just want to put that out there, that all input isn't necessarily driving, driven from the same point of view. I appreciate that point and I, I would add that I think I would have concerns if our way of getting information from families is simply by putting something on the website because there's a very specific demographic of families that we would then miss who aren't checking the website, who aren't thinking about that, and there would need to be some other form of outreach to be able to really collect data and feel like there's integrity to that. I was actually just going to make that point. I was going to say the downside to doing that type of research, which is really all I think we can do at this time, is that you will miss a very important segment of the population. No. Sorry, I was just going to, I, I understand that you're saying you want this to be revenue neutral, but when you look at the data that schools in Massachusetts have provided on the improvements in high schools, then, I mean, like Nauset Regional, they had a 53% drop in failing grades, a decrease in suspensions from 166 to 19, a decrease in targets. Like, I'm starting to think this is worth the money to maybe look at another alternative. When you think about how much extra support we're providing and extra classroom aids, if it truly has this big of an impact on student behavior and office referrals, and we're paying all this money for extra um, specialists to help work on with students. I, I wonder if we also need to to look again at the possibility of investing in this. So I do feel confident that we have the answer to the, what's the lowest cost plan. It's my last proposal. It's the quintuple hub model. Um, so if the school committee wants to direct us to include that within the budget, they can certainly do that. The research for that is done. The planning for that is done. It would have to be updated. At the time, it was about $91,000. I would estimate with inflation, it's probably at this point maybe $110,000 to $115,000. Um, but that's something that could be done and wouldn't require additional outreach because the only, the only group that would be impacted is the high school who's I think I think we've got enough data from all groups that they're in support of a later start time can you can you say more what that plan is for 91 or whatever the amount is what does it look like so I'll uh, refer you to I think it's clip number two <laughs> in the email I sent out last night um, it basically instead of getting door-to-door uh, -door, neighborhood to neighbor or or street corner to door transportation. Students would uh, walk to the four elementary schools and get buses there to go out to JFK or the high school. Um, the fifth hub that I realized we could put in last time we did it would be to use the high school as a hub too that students going to JFK could walk to in order to be transported back to JFK. So if you do that, essentially what it does is it knocks down to, it, it removes some of the buses that you have running on two tiers, which offsets the cost of running additional high school buses <coughs> on three tiers. I will say there is one other caveat to this, which will come into play no matter what, 
which is that we may have to increase the number of routes we have next year anyways. Um, you're hearing a little bit about buses getting home late from elementary. That's because some of our routes are getting stretched out. So there's a possibility that we'll need to do that in, in any scenario. Um, so the likely transportation increase if we do that would be not only the cost of going back to plan number six, but would be the cost of adding additional routes to uh, address the increased ridership at elementary and middle school. And so would those, I'm sorry, <laughs> would those compound it is, uh, or is the increase, the natural increase that would happen because of these route changes, would that cushion some of the added cost? It wouldn't cushion or compound, it's just two blocks that would build on each other. So, thanks. Just a, a couple comments. Um, going back, so I remain sensitive that this is not helpful to working families with kids in elementary school and that the proposal on the table and that potentially it would be hard on elementary school students and it's not clear to what extent that would be the case. Um, two thoughts though are it's still a six hour day, which is a short work day, and, and families typically probably work longer than six hours, so just a thought. Um, and, and probably need to provide childcare after school and, and sometimes before. So sometimes people can shift that, sometimes they can't, but there's still gonna be need to be childcare. And with this suggestion of potentially not being cost neutral, I just wonder if instead of trying to add to the busing, if we add slightly to the elementary school day, I know that's that's more complicated, but more in the longer term, I've heard some of the elementary school, I think principals, I could be miss, at least one, saying six hours is a short day. Um, and so I'm not really putting this on the table for this year, but looking forward, as Ms. Buzanski said, it's gotta be a continued conversation. That would be another option, would be to, how much does it cost to make the elementary school day 15 minutes longer? Because in some ways that actually solves a lot of this problem. Um, you, you could still start the elementary school at nine o'clock with this proposal. The problem is you can't get the kids home. That's the real problem, right? With your proposal of putting. Say that again. <laughs> we can start one school at eight, one school at 8.30 and one school at nine. The reason there's such a big gap between JFK and the elementary school is because we can't bus all the kids home. It's because the elementary school day is only six hours. They have to be bused home six hours after they get to school. So if you send them to school um, only a half hour after JFK, both schools get out at the same time and you have to have the buses at two schools. So this is why um, the 920 start is being proposed for the elementary schools, right? That's right. So if you had a longer day, which costs money, but if we're gonna start talking about spending money, I would rather put money into educating the kids than into more buses, I think. <laughs> yes, Ms. Fallon. Is it something difficult to do to cost that out? Um, it's it's impossible to cost that out because the cost of that will only be known through negotiations. Yeah, so that would be it's, a, okay. It's, I, and I know that I'm just. <laughs> Do you? I know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't. Mr. Kaufman. Yeah, I want to. I want to hear what our student rep <laughs> say, and then I have something to add myself. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm like remembering the information that we gathered from the survey of the high school students and how there were some students who were concerned or just were mentioning that like a half an hour difference in the start times they don't think would have that big of an impact so I think that's just something to consider in the discussion you know because it seems like with the proposal that we have now that the biggest impact would be on the high schools but would it or like the most positive impact would be on the high schools but would it really be that big of a positive impact if we're only moving it back half an hour um, would it be, you know, I, I think it's just in support of having, like switching the start times again would be, I guess, a more ideal situation, just, but yeah, something to consider. Mr. Collins. So I, I'm, not, I'm not 
Right. We're not voting tonight, I don't think, and I'm not hearing a large, a large number of, of uh, my colleagues feeling like we're ready to go with this idea. I could be wrong, but I, I just don't sense that at all. So <coughs> that what leaves us is, is a couple of major questions. One is, do we want to continue to have this discussion? It, these are long meetings. These are complicated things that have been debated for a long time, and we just don't seem to be coming up with an answer. Um, if we do decide we want to continue, I, 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 I heard some solid things tonight. I heard Dina's request to come up with, like, let's help everybody get up to speed, and I'm one of those people. Um, I just I need to find out a lot more about it, and maybe maybe we schedule a meeting for the, the folks that need that that would feel more comfortable moving ahead if they at least got all the his history and were able to get some of their questions answered. Simultaneously, I keep hearing really good ideas from Susan. I, I don't know whether they you know, they just I, I don't know if these have been tried and tested, and I don't know whether there's other ideas. So it, it also seems like maybe it's worth. Um, not only bringing people up to, to speed on where everything was up till now, but maybe it's time to revisit some other alternatives, like let's go back and look at models, see how much they cost. Maybe it's worth paying. Um, maybe Dr. Provost can put some of the stuff in our budget. Maybe there's models that are worth re-looking at. The population has changed, population size. So it's two things. If we're going to get into this, it really feels like we're going to need to continue having this discussion, and we need a forum and a process for doing it. And there's also a simultaneous need for people to learn the history of it. And that's only if people aren't just ready to say, forget it, this isn't going to work, which it, it feels like there's still energy. It feels like, and I'll just say this one more time, our major focus as a school committee is, is student achievement. And we rarely, as I think Laura pointed out, we, we, this could be it. I mean, we really have few opportunities to make such a potential impact on enhancing student improvement. And, and that's why probably there's so much interest in at least secondary schools moving later. Um, I don't know if there is any way we can go about doing this without some people taking, with us taking a risk or some potential downside to everybody else, but that's what's holding us back. If, if it was an elementary school, we, would, you know, we wouldn't have that problem. We would have done it if we were just a secondary school district. So I, I guess in summary, there's a lot of energy to continue. I think people want to. I really feel like Dana's idea needs to be capitalized on to find out what's happening. And if there's another small group of folks that really want to brainstorm ideas and um, come up with other potential solutions or new ways of, of moving ahead, I would support that as well. So my, my thought was whether, and again, stop me if, I don't, I don't know what the protocol is here. But, and I also don't know if this has already been done, it probably has, but it seems like there needs to be a subcommittee because I don't think we all as, a, as an entire committee can take up school committee time to continue to talk about it, but whether maybe there needs to be and whether it would be beneficial to have a subcommittee of people to, to work on this in a, in a quick manner. Been sub, there have definitely been subcommittees. There have been, um, <laughs> um, and there, there's even been like a community <laughs> committee. There's been lots of different models tried. So yeah, there's definitely been. That's, I, that's, yes, yes. I, and I think what we're hearing from the superintendent is there's not really time for him to kind of put that together in the next few months while we're going well, we're through the budget, the budget yeah. and, process. But I could, and, I could right. be wrong. No, that's exactly what I'm saying. And also, I would add. If you want me to put in any of the other models to the budget, I would need to know really quickly because we're already working with multiple models of the budget right now. And so um, the sooner I can know if I'm throwing these things in or not, the better. I, I just want to add, I, I really appreciate the position people are in just arriving here and not having been part of this conversation. And I really appreciate the staff and teachers and the entire um, community of the elementary schools, the families, who this probably looks not so attractive to. At the same time, I really am sitting here feeling like for student learning and how early the high school kids have to get on those buses and what we know about how little sleep they're getting, <coughs> um, that at some point I would support just saying let's try a trial period of this model and I'll, I'll take it a step further to just say I, I, I guess I was kind of my own subcommittee I had to kind of accept this and I'm not saying people should just believe me I understand where you are I'm just one person but um, 
in some of these meetings, I really tried to explore with our bus coordinator an idea like, could we start JFK at the same time and the elementary schools at the same time, finish them at the same time, and put the high school in the middle of the start time. So it would probably be around 8.15. And I think there's a lot of unknowns. Like, what is the traffic like then? Would it actually work? And then the other thing that probably has changed since five years ago when whatever model you're re referencing happens, <coughs> we have all these vans driving kids who have who can't ride the regular school bus for whatever reason and it's complicated so it, there's the whole bus contract and then there's all these other vans and drivers and it's just not clear how these routes will work so I think in some ways mixing it up adds this extra risk of what is it going to look like in terms of just logistics and which buses are going to be regularly late and and you know, it's a balance between how many people are we going to upset and disrupt versus the good we're going to do for the kids who really need more sleep. Um, I just will respond to that last piece um, because this was before your time. We did look at the vans when we did the last model. Uh, one of the things we found, which I think will still be true, is that you <coughs> have to add vans to cut buses. So, but we we found that you know, even with doing that, it was still a little bit less costly than the prior model that was developed by the Versatrans um, consultants. So I, I, I get the impression that there's not sure, clearly not going to be a vote on this uh, tonight, and I just wonder whether we should um, uh, just move it to our move it to a future meeting. I mean, move it to the next meeting and allow people some time to think, allow people some time to go back and watch those YouTubes if they want to, of the, and look at some of the previous models that the superintendent sent out before this meeting. Um, and then and then next meeting decide, do we want to like form a, sub, a special subcommittee or refer this to a committee or what we want to do about it? Um, I just don't know that we're going to be able to solve anything tonight. I, and, um, so. I mean, really what was before us was this one select proposal that we asked the superintendent. So I don't really know that we kind of have to stick with what's on the agenda and not veer off into like creating other proposals. So. I would move to, oh, sorry, that didn't. Oh, I was just going to suggest we put discussion and possible vote on the next agenda. That's probably, and then I just also wanted to add that that sort of 91,000, which today might be more like, did you say 110? 110, 115, yeah. I, would I, guess. I, re I remember when that, I remember reading about in the Gazette when that 91,000 was um, presented on what we would have to cut to, to make that happen and, and how painful that, I mean, I just wouldn't underestimate like how really kind of devastating that would be to the high school, I, th from what I remember six years ago. So I, I don't think that's an easy proposal, unfortunately, unless you disagree with me, Dr. I, I don't. Dr. Um, <laughs> no, no, I don't. And I'll, I'll share the rationale that I, I gave at that time, which was supported by that committee. I don't know if it would be supported by this committee, but my feeling was if you do it in a delinked way, we are adding cost just to re provide a later start time for the high school, the cuts need to come from the high school because None of the other schools are getting any benefit from that. You can't take things away from them to add to the benefit that you're creating for the high school. So yes. that's and what makes it harder. You can't spread right. it out over the and whole And that's business. what it made it sort of so devastating to the high school is my memory of reading that's that. Right. And then the, just to my last point, Eleanor, to, what, to your point about how much would it really help those students, I also kind of, I see it from the flip side. How much would it really hurt the elementary school students? Exactly. So that's all. I was just throwing, so along those lines though, the, in terms of the cost, I mean, I arguably, it would, the elementary schools would want to invest in not having a 925 start time, right? Because I mean, if the 50% if of the teachers and education showing that, research showing that earlier is better for the students, then in a way, I guess you could, in terms of the cost centers, you could arguably say this is in the interest of elementary to contribute rather than just cutting it off from the high school because Otherwise, you're going to start at 925, if that makes sense. 920, sorry, 920. You know, it's a it's a rational argument and worthy worthy of consideration. But we began the, the, the meeting with public comment with people saying how they feel already stretched. I think it might be difficult to hear to tell them you're going to be stretched a little bit farther so that we can get a, a later high school time. 
We'll see. I mean, but if you direct me to spread it out over all cost centers, I can absolutely spread it out over all cost centers. Okay. So does someone want to make a motion to postpone consideration of this until our next meeting? Um, I thought she already did. I'll, I'll make a motion to postpone <laughs> consideration and possible vote of this exactly. proposal to the next meeting. Is there a the second? Meeting. second? Yeah, I have a concern about saying we're not ready to make a vote now and then delaying a month to do it. And then next month we'll decide whether or not to build a subcommittee. I think there's consensus that we want to change the high school start date. We want to find a solution that works. We want to do it in a timely manner. Um, but we're not ready to do it right now. I'm wondering if it's possible to make the decision to take a more aggressive action step to build the subcommittee, to decide tonight to create a subcommittee um, to consider this over the course of the next month before the next meeting. Certainly that's definitely an option if that's a proposal someone wants to make. I'd um, like to, okay. Um, so I just wanna, so there's a motion to postpone um, that's been made and seconded. Um, do you, are, is the maker of the motion willing to withdraw that for purposes of? I, I don't, I don't think they're mutually control. exclusive. Okay. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well said. Okay. <laughs> then I think we need to sure. vote on it and then we'll take up your request to form a subcommittee. So all those in favor of postponing this until the next meeting, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? And then I'll open it to you to make a motion um, about what you'd like us to do. Sure, I move that we just create a subcommittee to meet before the next meeting to um, research and discuss the options for um, changing the high school start date. Our next meeting is in two weeks. Yeah. Oh, you're okay, right. Oh, February that, right, right. Next February 9th. Meeting. Sorry, that's the, norm, the norms meeting. Mm -hmm. So. Got a couple questions, but you've, she's made a motion. It needs a second first. Is second. It? So there's a second. Okay. Got two questions right here. Um, I so I'm wondering, uh, Ms. Goldman, if if your idea of this subcommittee is the same or different than Mr. Kaufman's earlier suggestion about a gathering to educate, because I, I what I'm hearing is that that. Or what I heard from Mr. Kaufman was that he heard from the rest of the committee that we need to get up to speed on these things. We, we want to educate ourselves about what has already been tried and reasons why those things may or may not work uh, in this uh, time now. So that to me feels a little different than a subcommittee to meet to consider and research various options. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, I'm just concerned that I, I want to understand like really clearly what it is you're proposing because there's a big there would be a big difference between a subcommittee of members of the school committee versus an ad hoc committee as far as open meeting law um, and so I don't think that we can vote to form a subcommittee until we're really clear on what the composition of that subcommittee would be and who would be leading it and who would be appointing the members and deciding the composition so I don't know if you've given that thought yeah, so I would like to amend my, I'd like to move to amend my proposal um, for it not to be a subcommittee, but rather a ad hoc meeting. Okay. So not just school committee members, but also other members of the committee? I mean, other members of the community, like teachers and... So there's no way we, I, that would no. be challenging yeah. to form by February, yeah. just forming it I, challenging. Yes. Um, but the, go ahead. Right so. right, so I'm not exactly sure what kind of a group it is, clearly. I don't know, <laughs> you know, how, but I, I'm just, I am proposing that we find a way to meet before mm -hmm. um, the next meeting where this is discussed. Dr. Could I just observe that Practically speaking, the easiest way to do that might be just to call another meeting. And people who have already been a part of the conversation for years might <coughs> have to attend that. You know, we don't, wouldn't necessarily have to schedule any votes, so you wouldn't even have to worry about a quorum. But if people want to find out, you know, more about what's been tried in the past, it could just be a school committee meeting, I think. Mm -hmm. right. Is that possible? I would, I would 
put forth that to, to in response to Emily's question that in my mind we're talking about two separate things one is the need for people to get up to speed and the other is a desire of folks to talk about potential creative solutions in addition to what's already on the table <coughs> so I think I just want to make it clear that there's an I think there's a need for both that's part of why I was saying just moving it one way or the other just so that people would have enough time even just to review all the material that was already sent to you as well we've got when we've got all the old past reports we've got all we can all that can be provided to you um, so. yeah um, as I'm sitting here I'm I'm really attracted to the idea of this group since we already are formed as a committee um, having letting people get up to speed maybe having some q a at the beginning but having like a major brainstorming session and i think what's really positive is it sounds like we're all committed to trying to think creatively and seeing what we can do on a time frame that works for our community and so it's a little bit of a commitment because i do feel like it needs to happen before february um, but i would be i would be in favor of finding a time for us to do that work is that is that and I think both those things could happen together just it's it seems like a very worthwhile uh, but a very overly ambitious agenda I mean just I don't really see how this <coughs> might be realistic before our meeting in February I mean this is kind of what I was trying to sort of express earlier that I think it's really important to keep moving forward to coming up with a better solution. I don't know that that should detract from just the, trying this out in the interim, but those are two separate things. We've put the, we've, we will be having this discussion again and a possible vote on the next agenda in February. And I think in the meantime, it is really important to get folks up to speed and start working towards how to, but I think we all know, or maybe we don't all know, I, I feel like that having one thing we've learned from the past 10 years is one big meeting isn't going to result in the solution. Unfortunately, it's going to take more than that. I want to speak strongly in favor of what Ms. Wazanski is saying right now. <clears throat> I think what we just learned is if you ask, can we push the time back 30 minutes, it takes 10 months to get enough feedback from the community for the community for the community to possibly be ready to vote so if we get any new ideas that comes out of that I think you're definitely talking about next fall next winter before you even consider any of those ideas because they would have to all go through the same process which I'm not opposed to doing look this has been going on for decades it can, who knows how long it'll go on for but the idea that we could have a meeting, we could come up with some new ideas, and then we could get enough information for the committee members to feel comfortable to vote on, I think is completely unrealistic in my experience with this issue. I also just want to be mindful of the superintendent, you know, what we're asking him to do, because we're also asking him to create a first view budget for February. Um, and so that's just right in the heart of the time that he's working with his alt team um, to do that. So I'm just, that's the other kind of thing that's happening at the same time. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I guess I'll just uh, speak in support of what Dr. Voss had said earlier about um, thinking of this as a, as a potential pilot. So if we're going to approve this, we approve it for a specific amount of time with the commitment as a committee to revisit it at, uh, at an appointed time. Um, but, uh, building on what Ms. Goldman was saying, like, if we're going to be doing it at our February 13th meeting, currently we, what we just voted on is to do the same process on February 13th. Like, I mean, I don't know, can we go back and, I just don't, does, from the conversation we're having here in terms of the timeline, we're going to be in the exact same place in less than about a month without any new information in many ways. Like, I mean, it doesn't seem like realistic to even have this on the agenda for February 13th based on what I'm hearing. because. Um, if we're going to be opening up a can of worms, like there's no way to be ready for that. And so, I don't know, I wonder why we, thinking back on it, like it just seems like it's unrealistic. So, um, where I'm at, maybe <coughs> listening to you all on February 13th, that gives everybody a month to digest what we've talked about tonight. 
and and I do I agree with what Dr. Provo is saying, having been through these conversations. But I think it we're we're all getting there together in terms of what's realistic for a month. But in a month, come back and say, are we willing, or do we feel it's in the best interest of the students to? to go ahead with a pilot knowing that it's not going to be great for everybody or is it better not to and maybe people would feel more comfortable being at that point in a month and maybe realistically that's all we can do. Great and that may, I think that's probably all we could realistically achieve in the month is that folks maybe felt like they were more at a place where they could vote for or against it, that they were more knowledgeable about it, they could be briefed by the superintendent in whatever way we find you know, most amenable. And then at the same time, I really like yeah, or thinking about Ms. Goldman's idea or what Ms. Serafi Cox put forward of that we have to keep, figure out a really intentional way that we're gonna keep the conversation going and try and brainstorm and solve this problem because we do have a lot of new energy and interest on the committee and it's not a perfect proposal. It is definitely not a perfect proposal. So that's, I think, the value of having it on the February agenda. But you're right, we may all sit here in February and decide that we're not going to vote on it, I guess. So we've already approved to push it to the February meeting or just to post it <coughs> to its consideration, which is to roll it over to the February meeting. So I guess the question remains, do you want to um, do you want to wait and hold off till to see how that discussion goes, and then we can discuss what we want to do at that point? Or I think what I want to do is um, come up to speed before then, and I ask the committee to let me know what you think is the best way for me to go about doing that. Is that include that we all come together and meet, or am I independently? meeting with individuals to figure out, you know, what the process has been thus far. Well, we can try to send people as much of the historical data that we have, like the past reports. I think the superintendent assembled some videos, uh, some clips of some of the previous presentations. Right, yes. Um, um, unfortunately, people can't really get together and informally. That doesn't really work under our model because right. of open meeting law. So it would have to be a structured meeting of some kind for that to happen. So I think that'll be part of it is just us providing you with some of that background on the various models and giving you a chance to just absorb some of it and see where, where we've been. I'd like to just put a brainstorm out, which is I'm willing, if, if six of us are willing to get together, we could have a meeting. And mm -hmm. I, I'll put out I'm willing to, I'm happy to do that. I do feel like our new members, especially those with younger kids who haven't been part of this conversation, um, deserve to have a chance to have this kind of conversation. And maybe we could consider how many of us would be available, say, an hour before our retreat starts in two weeks, and just have an hour where we can talk. And those of us who have been around could help others get up to speed. It's not necessarily to solve the problem, but just to have the conversation. Um, and would you want Dr. Provost to be there to provide information, or how would that work? Because that, that would be, we just need to prepare for that. I mean, I guess I'm hearing pe people being told, oh, just go look at the videos. I think that can be really hard by yourself. And we, at this point, I'm not sure I can actually talk to people, because I've already talked to current committee members. And with open meeting law, it gets scary pretty quick so um, I don't have strong feelings if doctor I know dr. provost is very busy if he can be there I think that's lovely but if he can't be just having six of us able to say you know I think this is my understanding of it and just have it that place where people can have a conversation this is such a big topic and important All of us, it sounds like. that's just an idea an hour before the you know Whatever time that retreat. So the retreat is scheduled for 6:30. So that would push that. That would have to then be at five. Other people can make other suggestions. That might not work for yeah. people. It's just, I'm just starting the brainstorm. <laughs> That's a good idea. Right? <laughs> Dr. Uh, just to respond, if there is a time when everyone can get together, 
as long as it coordinates with my schedule, I'd be happy to, to be there because I think that's the most efficient way, really, in terms of time and everything, if I can talk to everybody at once. Um, but I'll, I'll just say that I would also appreciate um, if people who've been a part of Northampton for longer than I have can be there because <laughs> I don't know the whole story, right? I mean, this goes back at least three superintendents prior to me of people trying to solve this problem. So there may be people with more institutional knowledge on this than me. So there's only two meetings in January. There's the there's the retreat, and then there's the joint committee meeting on January 30th. It starts at seven, actually. Um, I think it's seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. seven, seven. p.m. So um, so those are the two opportunities in January. So, so. Oh, I was just going to voice that I would prefer to have it tacked on to an you know making an existing <coughs> committee rather than meeting rather than adding an additional meeting. I would, I would voice that my preference, if we were going to do January 23rd, would be that we still meet at 6:30, but rather than 6:30, 8:30, we meet 6:30 to 9:30 to add the hour in. So do it at the end. At the end. Or at the beginning and make our retreat start at 7:30. Either, either way. Do we have people coming for that? We do. So, so tacking on to the end would probably be the best. tacking it on to the end would be the best. And we would set an alarm for one hour, <laughs> and then we leave. Yes. <laughs> Six o'clock work for you? Which way is the no. talking stick? <laughs> Don't worry about it. So we're going to keep the 6.30 retreat time, start time, with the idea that we'll go in. We'll go an extra hour after that or allow for an hour after that, as long as we can maintain a quorum. <coughs> okay. I don't really think that that requires a vote because really the only thing that's the start of the meeting is the most important piece for the law, so we don't have to actually we have to post the end of the meeting. So um, as we've shown here many times, that you, can, <laughs> you can keep going to, to the next day even. Um, <laughs> so, um, so are folks comfortable with where we've left that discussion? So we'll we'll plan to on the on the twenty third to have allow time afterwards for an opportunity for some group education and discussion around the start time issue. So the um, so the next item on the agenda is a vote to um, to refer the city council's select committee on pesticide reduction report to the budget and property com subcommittee, and I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> All those in favor of that referral, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any objections? <coughs> okay. So the next item, um, for those of you who watched our last meeting in December, we had a robust discussion about whether it made sense for the outgoing school committee to um, be voting on certain policies. And so the idea was that we'll just push this uh, ahead to the first meeting of the new school committee. Unfortunately, I don't think we were, maybe it was late at night, we weren't thinking that that first meeting, we wouldn't actually have any subcommittees at that point. <laughs> so we're asking a subcommittee to report to us that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm recommending that we defer this discussion until our next meeting when we actually have a rules and policy subcommittee. I doubt I'll get a lot of argument on that tonight. So, um, so we're just gonna. I'm just gonna do that. I'm just yep. gonna say we'll 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 skip over L since we can't actually get a report from that committee. Um, so we'll move right to the business administrator's report and the personnel report. So in your packet, um, I included business report. Here's the twenty appropriation report, which is the monthly expenditure report from our local budget through December. There's a few areas with deficits. Um, I'm working with administrators to have them do the transfers um, and put those um, transfers through. And if the amount is um, higher than what's needed for your approval, it'll be back to the school committee for approval for those transfers. Um, I'll answer any questions if anybody has any questions about the financial report. Um, there are no gifts this month um, under the $1,000 limit. There are two bill warrants that are included in the packet that your representatives have signed during December.
and personnel report. We've had four new hires since our last meeting and one separation. Okay, now we have the superintendent's report. Thank you. After giving cost center managers some preliminary education and homework in December, the FY21 budget process began in earnest this week with a day-long budget retreat and the distribution of our annual budget survey. As of this morning, 297 employees had responded to the survey. Principals will assist me in a coordinated distribution of the budget survey for families in the larger community tomorrow. Because we need to present the first view budget without knowing the outcome of the override vote, we are working on two budget scenarios. Since we always make some adjustments in response to the public comment on the proposed budget, this means we will likely be bringing forward two draft budgets and two revised budgets during the process. I'm sorry, Cammie. Um, <laughs> the year we went through three iterations was quite challenging and this budget preparation cycle promises to give us an opportunity to set a new personal record, um, uh, surpassing our financial planning endurance by at least 33%. So um, the budget is many things, including a strategic instrument to allow us to fully exploit our organizational strengths and to remediate our weaknesses and limitations. And so we began this budget process, as we do every year, looking at some, of, some sources of data to help us see our strengths and weaknesses more clearly. As we reflected on the information this week, we found some common themes reflected in work in which we've been most successful. We obtain our best results when the relationships between educators, students, and families are supportive. Likewise, we do our best work when we come together to solve problems rather than to point fingers. Education is a team sport and it only works if the players get along with each other and to quote a certain NFL coach if everyone does their job. Um, we also do best when we put students first, demonstrate flexibility, and affirm the many ways of being represented among our students. And finally, we know we can't improve our le learning without improving teaching. So we experience our greatest successes when we're willing to change our practices. And that comes from the first part of the meeting when this wall was covered with success stories and students who we'd really felt like we'd been able to reach and every principal had an opportunity to talk about some great thing that was happening in their school. Those were the themes that came from that. Um, so then we also talked about our weaknesses and limitations. It will probably come as no surprise that we identified lack of professional development as a significant weakness. As we compared ourselves to higher performing districts serving similar populations, I think we found that we are under investing in professional development. We have fewer professional development days than many districts, which makes it harder to match their professional development spending. Um, but that's a challenge, it's not insurmountable. Um, we're working on some ideas for that. Our programming for students aged 18 to 22 also requires attention. Although we've made progress in this area in recent years, more work remains to be done. As an aside, I had a chance to visit the newly appointed life skills model apartment in the NHS today, and I don't think I've ever seen a happier group of students and staff. Um, the stickers were still on, the appliances, Oh, at least the washer and the dryer. Um, but the new range is getting a good workout from students who are learning how to make nachos. This means so much to the staff in the program. Um, when Dr. Plummer and Mr. Messing and I walked into that room, teachers literally came up and hugged us for finally giving them tools that were appropriate to serve the needs of their kids. Um, these are the kind of moments that only happen when you're open to new ways of doing things. And in spite of this wonderful experience, we still see this as an area of weakness because not all life skills can be taught in the classroom. We need to do more work getting our kids out into the community to learn real life skills. We also think there are gaps in services for students who may not qualify for any categorical program but who struggle to succeed nevertheless. A teacher in the district recently described this group to me as those at the bottom of the middle. 
they don't need intensive support, but they do need something more to reach their full potential. The something could be as simple as a little academic redirection or an intentional relationship building effort. Could be some of the strategies that we heard tonight when we were discussing our SEL turnaround plan. Another group that needs support but doesn't fit into any categorical um, support category are the increasing number of students with significant trauma histories we're serving in our schools. Increasing our school's capacity to provide trauma sensitive environment <coughs> is key to helping these students in an area that we identify as weakness that we'd like to remediate through the budget process. We identified making learning more engaging for all students as a high priority need. As one of the few district administrators who gets to observe classes along the whole pre-K to 12 continuum, I can tell you that too often something is lost along the way from preschool to graduation. The essential problem for us is to find out how to ensure that the instructional models continue to present students with learning opportunities that are relevant and rigorous for them so that they're engaged at age 18 as they were at age three. We continue to have concerns about central office capacity, especially as our population of English learners grows and the reporting requirements for ESL programs becomes more rigorous. And we continue to keep an eye on potential pockets of disproportionality. Um, we did receive, um, as you know, a clean bill of health from the Department of Education showing that we're not over identifying students in any um, racial category, but we do have higher rates of I identification for Hispanic and Latino students and for black students. And so we, we continue to monitor that and continue to look at that as potentially symptomatic of um, some structural barriers to success for those students within our district. And this provides a segue to the overarching weakness that we've discussed many times and that, um, and that is creating more cu culturally responsive learning environments. That aligns with my student learning goal that focuses on improving the achievement of Hispanic and Latino students. It also aligns with my professional practice goal involving equity scorecard practices and equity mindedness. And with respect to that, I can report that I've had some direct communication with Dr. Ben Simone, and she suggested that the Education Trust might be a better partner for her, for me than her organization, so I may be proposing a, a change to that goal. I have reached out to the Education Trust, so there may be more to come on that. Um, the main reason she said that is Education Trust has more experience in the pre-K to 12 sector. She does have some um, pre-K to 12 experience, but is more in higher ed, so that's the reason for that shift. Also, um, it's, well, not also. So that gives you a sense of some of the strengths and weaknesses that we've identified and that we hope to address through the budget process. Um, this promises to be a very interesting budget season, um, but I think you can get a sense of some of the themes that you can expect to see represented in the first few budget that we bring forward. Um, of course, we still haven't gotten the feedback from the community. I would be surprised if they see things much differently than the administrative team does. Usually their feedback sort of affirms what we've seen as our strengths and weaknesses, but there may be some changes when we get that feedback as well. Um, so uh, it's been a very, very busy week so far. We've run four scenarios already this week. So thank you, Cami. Um, it's gonna be a marathon, but you're a great partner for that. So that's What was the closing part. date for that survey? The, the closing date hasn't been set yet. We okay. usually leave it open. <coughs> right past the, the first view budget because sometimes people come in and give other feedback after the first view budget is presented. So it'll be open for a long time. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Superintendent. Um, so we have, um, because we're gonna adjourn um, <coughs> from executive session, I, I just wanna announce the business, um, future business and meeting dates that we have to offer the public, the school committee retreat on norms, Thursday to <coughs> January 23rd. 6.30 p.m. JFK Community Room, the Joint City Council School Committee meeting on Thursday, January 30th, 2020, JFK Community Room, and then our regular school committee meeting that begins with the Student Advisory Council Thursday, February 13th at 6.15 p.m. Um, 
I also just wanted to announce to all the members that now that we have approved our rules of procedure and we've made the final tweaks to all of our committees, et cetera, um, I will be sending out our requests um, tomorrow, um, asking people to give me their preferences for committees and for the other assignments. Um, and uh, I have seven days from when this organizational meeting occurs to make those appointments. So now that I actually know what the committees and assignments are, I'll send them out to you. And, um, and so you'll be seeing that tomorrow and have a chance to get those back to, uh, back to me sometime next week so I can do that. So with that, we do have a um, request for an executive session. Um, and I would ask if um, a member could make a motion to uh, move into executive session. Which so essentially is, well, actually, I need someone to read the um, read the motion. So it needs to be it needs to be read. Okay. Uh, like to request for an executive session in JFK Library under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Chapter 30A, Section 213 <coughs> to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares and Chapter 30A, Section 21A2 to hold grievance hearings whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's negotiating position. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, this requires a roll call vote, and the, it's either a yes or a no, a, or a yay or nay, to go into executive session or not. Mr. Sean Condon? Uh, yes. Mayor David Narkowitz? Yes. Mr. Ronnie Gold? Yes. Mr. Becca Busansky? Yes. Ms. Laura Fallon? Yes. Christina Levy? Yes. Mr. Lonnie Coffin? Ms. Kaya Goldman? <coughs> yes. Yes. Okay, so the committee has voted to move into executive session. I need to advise the public that we are now moving into executive session because to hold this meeting in a public session would be detrimental on our bargaining position. I also want to advise the public that we will adjourn from executive session and not return to open session. Thank you very much.